Great, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the virtual 2023 Biennial Workforce Summit presented by ACU Star Center, Community Health Center, Inc. and the National Association of Community Health Centers. Today's event wouldn't be possible without the Health Resources and Service Administration known as HRSA. And if we could advance to the next slide. For the agenda today, before I give us a glance at day two, I just wanna give a reminder on what we covered yesterday. And if you couldn't join us yesterday, we do have the slides posted to the Weitzman Education Platform, which you use to register. And we should have the day one recording within the next few days posted as well. And we can send it out in an email. But day one, we had a fantastic keynote presentation from our HRSA administrators. We also had a wonderful presentation by the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers and Massachusetts General Hospital on their collaborative HRSA-funded Be Well Together initiative. We concluded our day with a panel on pathways and partnerships before wrapping up with a health center spotlight on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion principles into coaching and mentoring culture. As for day two, we had the fantastic April Lewis with her presentation, Work Well, How to Manage Your Time and Energy, which will really focus on how to manage your time and energy efficiently in the workplace for productivity, work-life harmony, and overall well-being. Following the keynote presentation, we'll hear from Gary Campbell from Johnson Health Center, who will discuss creating a coaching culture, which will really launch us into our panel for the day, which is a focus on coaching culture from two amazing experts in the field. We'll wrap up our 2023 Workforce Summit with a large group discussion. And with that, we'll also use Mentimeter and allow you to come off mute to connect with one another. If we could advance to the next slide, we'll go through some housekeeping considerations. So as you all know, we are on our Zoom platform today. So make sure you check your Wi-Fi, you test your video, test your audio. We do love to see people. So if you wanna turn on your cameras, that'd be much appreciated. Um, as for the microphone, please be courteous and please mute yourself when you are not speaking during the summit, but you will have to come off mute for our breakout groups. So if you wanna test, make sure that works, that's perfectly okay. As for the recording, we are recording today so we can share the recording with you, but please be aware that all sessions and chat box questions will be recorded for future work. We appreciate your consideration and cooperation in keeping the meeting informative and professional. Additionally, we do have several breaks scheduled throughout the day so you can stay, stay engaged with us, but we welcome you to eat and drink as needed during the meeting. So feel free to turn off your video at that point and make sure your, mute, your mic is muted. A few other housekeeping considerations. We have the Weitzman Education Platform, which you all use to register. I'm gonna go ahead and put that link in the chat just so you can get to it as needed. That's also how you're gonna claim CEU credit for any session you attend. You'll complete the evaluation and then be able to get your credit. If you have any technical difficulties, you'll be able to find submit a ticket and then our Weitzman education team will be able to see it. We could advance to the next slide. Ah, this was the Weitzman education platform. This is just a quick screenshot of what the homepage looks like. But as you'll see at the bottom of the screen, we have additional information where several attachments have been uploaded, including the agenda, the program, the PowerPoint from day one, our Mentimeter results from day one, as well as some resources from Open Door Health Services who presented the Health Center Spotlight during yesterday. And if we go to the next slide, Throughout the summit and today, we'll be using Mentimeter. So you can go ahead and access Mentimeter in several different ways. First, you can go to menti.com and type in the code on the screen, which is 39185783, or you can go ahead and scan the QR code. And the third way is I'm gonna put a link in the chat and you can just go ahead and click on it. Um, for right now, we're gonna use Mentimeter to launch a word cloud to find out what motivated you to attend the 2023 Workforce Summit? I'm gonna give folks a few minutes to just hop onto that Mentimeter. And if you have any technical difficulties, just feel free to write in the chat. 
And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing now, Megan, to pass it over to you. That is perfect. Thank you. Great. And a reminder that that link is in the chat so you can go ahead and join. I see 24 people of you. 24 people have joined us so far. That number is rapidly increasing. I don't know if it's just mine. It's kind of sitting on a page that says instructions. Great question. So it's going to sit there until I hit next slide. I'm just going to wait another 10 seconds or so. Perfect. Now I hit next slide. So you should be able all be able to see it on your screen. But the question is, what motivated you to attend the 2023 Workforce Summit? And it's a word cloud. So we welcome you to submit a few different words that motivated you to attend the Workforce Summit. Awesome. I love watching it fluctuate. So learning is a main one, as well as networking, resources. I see connection. It's coming out even bigger. And collaboration. Amazing. Awesome. 66 of you have answered. Fantastic. And learning network and resources are remaining as our top three. Some other great ones I see are staff satisfaction, idea sharing, engagement, inspiration. This is awesome. Thank you all so much. And we'll make sure to share this with you at the end of the day on the Whitesman Education platform. And a reminder that we will be using this throughout the day for breakout groups as well as the large group discussion. So if you wanna keep the link up, you're more than welcome to do so, and then you can get on it even easier later in the day. So thank you all for participating. Great, now I'm gonna pass it off to Suzanne to introduce our keynote speaker. Great, thank you so much, Megan. And um, as Megan mentioned, welcome back everyone. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, my name is Suzanne Spear. I'm the Senior Director of Workforce Development at ACU, and I have the pleasure of introducing today's keynote speaker, April Lewis. You can read her entire bio in the program, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about her um, before we get started. So April Lewis is the president and CEO of April Lewis Academy Incorporated, which is a coaching and consulting firm. She uses her extensive training and leadership background to help organizations transform from the inside out. April's guiding principle is human first, employee second. April's resume includes excelling in various roles in operations, training and technical assistance, for both community health centers as well as primary care associations. She also served as a combat veteran in Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Bright Star in Egypt. Her credentials include being a certified disc facilitator, certified health coach, certified executive coach, and certified neurolinguistic programming practitioner. She also re recently completed an um, interim position as chief operating officer at an FQHC based in Maryland. I know a lot of you, um, uh, April is a familiar face to you, but for those of you who don't know April, you're in for a treat. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, April. Thanks. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Wherever you are, it's so good to be here. Um, I'm smiling. I've been smiling since uh, you all joined because I'm looking through the chat and I see familiar names and familiar faces. So for those, this is my first time being in your presence. It is a pleasure to virtually meet you and to my old friends in this FQAC space. It's good to see you again, even if it's just by name. And I do hope that everyone is well on today. So as Suzanne said, we are talking about my favorite topic, which is wellness and wellness in the workplace. 
but I have some work for you to do at the start of this session. Yes, I'm speaking, but you have work to do. And the first thing I want you to do is to take out your phone because I'm pretty sure it's not too far away from you. So I want you to take it out because I have three images that I want you to take a picture of, but then put your phone down on do not disturb. And the first one is on your screen now. It is just a reminder that I want you to affirm to yourself often and share it with other people to tell yourself that you take care of yourself so you can take care of others. Now, I have been working with community health centers for years, over a decade. And one thing I know for sure is that you all are the best and brightest. You are the most capable. You know how to do your job. You know how to do it well. And you walk around with an S on your chest. And that S stands for super person and also for selfless servant. You put so many people before yourselves, oftentimes to the detriment of you. And I do believe that we've learned over the last few years how important it is to take care of yourself so you can do the good work that you do to take care of other people. And this other people includes your colleagues, your team, your patients, community members, and then your family when you go home or when you log out for the day. Now, don't be like me and take a lot of pictures and screenshots and forget that it's in your phone. So take these pictures and then remember, after we finish up for the day, send it somewhere so you can look at it, print it out, make a post-it note. But I want you to remind yourself to take care of you so you can take care of others. And secondly, I want you to take, care, take a picture of this quote. Jim Rohn is one of my favorite philosophers to listen to. He's now passed away, but if you ever just want to fill yourself up with personal and professional development tactics that are timeless, go to YouTube, put in Jim Rohn, and just enjoy. I want to give you a second to read this quote. This is what we want. We want to have energy and vitality and strength to do the work that we're called to do, whatever that looks like. And to do that, we must treat our bodies like a temple and not a woodshed. And you know, a woodshed is sitting in the backyard. It's typically not visually appealing. You throw stuff in it, but then when you need something that you know is in there, you have to dig and go through it. Oftentimes how we have to do with our energy, we have work to do, we have a meeting to facilitate, we have to travel, and we're wondering where we're going to pull the energy from and the focus because we have so many other things on our plate. So this is your reminder to treat your body like a temple and not a woodshed, which means to honor your body, care for your body, give your body what it needs. And that's different from person to person. There is no magic blueprint on how to take care of you. You have to do what's in the best interest of yourself for your mind, your body, and your spirit. And the other picture I want you to take is this one. Take care of your body because it's the only place you have to live. Now, we are doing a lot of interesting things in the world today with AI. We're creating stuff. You don't know what's real, what's fake, whatever the case may be. But what we haven't created yet is an ability to come out of this body and just go into another one so we can have more energy and more vitality and more energy. What you have with, for yourself right now is what you have. And you can increase your energy. You can make yourself healthier. But the what I want you to remember is to take care of yourself because it's the only place that you have to live. So get those three pictures. You're going to get copies of the slides, but I want you to reference them later. So here's what I want us to anchor in for today. Three things, work prioritization, what it is and how do we do it, task management, and what are your time and energy givers and takers? If you get nothing else from today, I want you to know what is the one thing that you know for sure gives you energy, that lights you up, that when you think about doing it or you are doing it, time can fly by and you have no recollection of, recollection of where it went. That's something that fuels you. And the true hack is to lean into more of those type of tasks and type of projects and conversations over the others. But we're going to get into it all today. So first, I want you to rate yourself. Just have a mindful moment. You can put it in the chat if you want to, but no pressure. How well do you manage your time? On a scale of one to five, with one being I don't manage it, it flies away. At the end of the day, I don't know what happened. And five being I complete everything that I say I will complete. Like you get things done. You were four, I see a four, a three, right in the middle. That's, that's about normal. Four, okay, I like the fours. I like the five, three and a half, very honest. 
And there is no right or wrong answer. We all know that there is no right or wrong answer. After today, we're all going to be better at it. Three and a half, that's very honest. Four, three, very good. Two, it's okay <laughs> with a sad face. Don't be sad. After today, you'll be fine, Helen. So next, I want you to think about how is your energy level on a scale of one to five? One being you should be in bed right now because you're drained. I hope that's not the case. And five being I have high energy. So I see some fours, threes, threes. 2.5, Jiraja of four, three, two and a half. So we're all about the same kind of medium. We're, we're all over the place and a lot of people in the middle for your energy level, which is perfectly fine. You are where you are. This is like, what's the gym? Planet Fitness, a no judgment zone. Now I want you to think about this. What do you believe takes your time? Is it one, unimportant task, two, getting distracted, or three, lack of focus? One, two, or three. And that shouldn't be rate. That's one. Two. What are your options? One, two, or three. Unimportant task, getting distracted. Oh, this world is designed to distract us, friends. Uh, for, <laughs> somebody put one, two, and three. I feel like I have onset ADHD. I'm happy that you said that because can we be honest for a moment? From this moment through the rest of my segment, we are best friends. And let me tell you why I need to be your best friend. Because I am going to step on some toes a little bit, but please know I'm stepping on them lovingly. And I'm also going to keep it very real with you because that's all I know how to do. We all have ADHD. We all have ADD. We all get distracted. We all lose focus. It is part of being a human, especially in this high-tech society. There are people that sit in rooms and basements and labs and they're developers. And all they study is how to get your attention. Their whole focus is to get you to pay attention to them or some content that they create. The width of a feed of your feed in your social media platforms, it is designed to pull you in, to release just enough dopamine so you can stay engaged and keep scrolling up. So it's not by happenstance that you feel like you have early onset ADHD, because we all do. And I mean that in a very light, joking, but serious way. So just breathe through that and know that it's okay, because it can be managed. And I want to ask you, knowing what we know, what that you're, you, you maybe can use more energy and you know what's taking your time. If you were given more time and energy, what would you do with it? Just think for a second, go on the visualization within yourself. If you had like a lot of executives say to me, if I just had more time in the day and I'll just smile because, well, you can't get it. But what would you do? You would train, learn, lead, write a book. Oh, that's beautiful. Things that I love. Yes, what do you love? Rest, listen more thoughtfully. Ooh, I love that. Sleep and exercise. Oh, be more creative. Being creative gives you energy. Oh, garden, family. So these are the things that you would do if you had more time. You see work, goals, family, friends, whatever the case may be, <laughs> delegate that. Delegate to elevate. Delegation is the key. Like there are certain things that you should do in your zone of genius and you should do because of your role, delegate the rest. Emily said, breathe. Oh, I invite you all to take a deep breath right now because we all need to breathe more, family and sleep. So this is what I wanna help you get to. I wanna help you get to where you can spend more time with your family, where you can get more sleep, good quality sleep, where you can train and learn and write that book because writing a book takes time and focus. I'm in the process of doing it right now. It's blocking out time, being undistracted and just writing, not seeking perfection and seeking performance. So I want to give you three principles of time and energy management. If you are taking notes, jot these down. If not, uh, you'll have the recording. You'll have access to the slides. The first principle is time is infinite. It's just here. It's, a, it's all over. It's going to be here when you leave, when we leave. It's going to keep going. But it's been cut, constructed in a finite manner. So we've taken this essence of what just is from like a universal level and we've constructed it in a way to where it is finite. We've constructed it into a 24 hour day, seven days a week, 52 weeks in a year. And if you take away eight of those hours, you should be sleeping. Now, if you do not get eight hours of sleep, I want you to say me in the chat, 
because I want to talk to you offline because we all know you should be getting eight hours of sleep. It's not easily done, but it is necessary so your body can recover. So if you're not getting eight hours, say me. I see you. I see all of you. We are going to have a one-on-one after this. <laughs> me, like, yes, you got to sleep, friends. That is your body's time to recover. And sleep is for the mind, the brain, and the body. So you're resting your body because you are sleeping, but you're also giving your brain time to recover. All day long, you are thinking. You're averaging 60 to 70,000 thoughts per day. That information has to be processed. That information has to be settled so you can retrieve it at the appropriate time. You want to be able to think and have memory and strengthen your cognition. That's what's happening when you're sleeping. Sleeping is recovering. There is resting and there is recovering. Both of them make up good sleep. Someone says, my circadian rhythm only allows me six and a half hours. That's good to know. And you can also manipulate your circadian rhythm. But if the key with that is every day, seven days a week, train your body to catch a rhythm. The time that you wake up, the time that you black out, no screen time, no TV, close the curtains, drop the temperature to your room. If you do that every day, you can tweak your circadian rhythm. Seven to eight hours of sleep, but sleep interruption often. Seven to eight hours is good, so I applaud you for that. So as you see, everyone has a different sleep cycle. The goal, and this is backed by research, we want to strive by eight hours. And then you pull out eight hours of working. So we're already down 16 hours from the day that we've constructed. And this is working. Now, don't forget, we're best friends. Really working, deep work, completing tasks, getting things done, and not just sitting in meetings and talking about the next meeting or talking about the meeting that you had before or the meeting that you should be having or probably will have after this meeting because we like to talk. Not that kind of work, real work, getting stuff done, strategizing, creating, completing tasks, lining things off your to-do list, actually fulfilling stuff, submitting things, real work. And I say that somewhat tongue in cheek because work includes all of that. You do need time to plan. You also need time to think. You need time to strategize. You need time to brainstorm. All of that's correct. It's about planning accordingly and not creeping from one to the next. So if you're having a strategy meeting, focus on creating a strategy. And then if there's another meeting for the follow-up, then you should be talking about what was done, not still strategizing. If that makes sense for me, say yes in the chat, because oftentimes our meetings get a little blurry. We start with one thing, and then we end up doing something else, and we're around the world and back again. Here's a hack for you. I'm going to drop as many hacks as I can throughout this segment. When you start a meeting, start with this one-liner. Now, don't tell everybody this. It'll make you look great at work. After this meeting, we will achieve X. After this meeting, we will achieve X. So that is very clearly saying once we finish this time together, 30 minutes, 45, 15, 60, 90, whatever the case may be, what will you achieve? And when there is an achievement, it's done. It's completed. You've gotten something over the ideation phase until the execution phase. So start your meetings by clearly saying what you will achieve, even if you just have to say it within yourself because you're the meeting facilitator. So good luck with that. Then you're left with eight hours. You've slept, you woke up, you ate a good breakfast, you worked, whether you're going in the office, going into the health center, or you're working remotely or a hybrid of two, that's 16 hours gone, and then you have eight hours left. What are you doing in those eight hours? Well, your personal hygiene, you're commuting. If you're going into the office, which most of you, I believe, are, you're running errands. Does groceries like just go away very quickly? Your chores or anything else in the adulting group, because it seems like there's always something to do. I close on my house. I'm here in Tampa, Florida. Uh, greetings from the Sunshine State. Keep us lifted. I closed on my house in August, and I feel like every time I turn around, there is something else to do. Always, every day, I'm looking at something, whether it's outside, inside, one room to the next. There is always something to do to be a responsible adult. Then you have ch children, your family members. They need time. A lot of you said in the chat, if you had more time, you would spend it with your family. And then if you're like me, your family doesn't even live where you live, so you have to travel to see them or make plans for them to see you. Then you have pets. I had a poodle for 11 years. It takes time to raise a puppy. 
and a dog. I don't know a lot about cats. I hear they're pretty self-sufficient. Me and cats haven't really like formulated relationships. But all of these things take time away from you. With the dog, you have to walk it, you have to tend to it. And then you have to cook and eat and then leisure things. What do you enjoy doing? And then even if that's doom scrolling, which is scrolling mindlessly on social media. And before you know it, you've consumed about 45 minutes of content and the clock is still ticking, even though you told yourself you were going to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night. That's called doom scrolling. Watch out for it. Here's a hack for my iPhone users, if you don't know. I don't know anything about Droid. Sorry, I'm that person. Team iPhone. You can set a timer for your social media to cut off after X amount of minutes per day. It's in your settings. You just go to it. I can't remember the exact. It's uh, screen control. So it's basically going to cut your so doom scrolling for me. It's political and social detriment. Okay. Let's, it, self awareness is key. So if you set your phone, it can shut down. I have mine set to 30 minutes of social media a day. And I can confidently say about 97% of the time, I do not go past the 30 minutes. Now, if you are a content creator like me and you have to push out posts and you're communicating with your followers, yes, you may go over, but you have to do, again, what works for you. You know the feeling when you've just been scrolling too much and you just feel like, oh, God, like I'll never get that time back. It happens to the best of us. And we even do it at work. People even do it at work. Now, whether you're scrolling on LinkedIn or whether you're scrolling on Instagram or you're scrolling on, scrolling on Facebook, you're still scrolling if you're not working. And if you're in that eight hour block of work, you're taking away time that you can be productive. So time isn't the issue as we can see because we have eight hours that are separate of work stuff and sleep. So your energy and your focus is the issue, which is okay because we're here to be solution oriented. So the second principle is that energy is a renewable resource, which means you can create more of it. You can control your energy. Your energy will adjust throughout the day. This is critical to the comment about the circadian rhythm. Our body is constantly moving and regulating itself throughout the day. And we also have a peak performance time. For a lot of people that I've come in contact with, especially executives that I work with, they say the morning time is best for them. For me, I'm pretty much like a seven to 10 type now with my schedule being more flexible. I like that time of morning. It's very still. It's still early. It's quiet. Energy is high. So when is your peak performance time? Tell us in the chat. When is the time of the day, whether it's an hour, two hours, three hours, when is it that you can just crank stuff out? You feel good. You sit up straight. You don't need to be caffeinated as much. You can just get stuff done. And what you'll see, as you see now in the chat, it's different for everyone. Some people are early risers. Like I have a friend, he is at his computer at 4.30 every morning. I don't even know if my computer turns on at 4.30 every morning because I haven't tested it and I will not. Like I hopefully I don't have to. Morning or evening. So that's two totally different times. And I'm sure, Melissa, that's depending on how much energy you put out, what you ate, what you have to work on. Morning is best. See, as you see, morning is good for a lot of people. And then we have Gerard who says 10 o'clock at night. See, my phone goes on do not disturb at 10 o'clock at night because it's time to go to bed. <laughs> so Gerard, you're a late night. Some people like that before 10 or, or after 4 a.m. and 6 a.m., early risers. So it doesn't matter what time your peak performance is. The key is knowing when it is so you can put tasks in that time where you need a lot of energy. So your energy can increase. You absolutely can increase your energy and renew it with rest and nutrition. Now, there is a word that I will not say on this session that when you eat a lot of food, good food most of the time, you get a little sleepy and lethargic and you want to go to bed afterwards and you can't focus. That's not this, the, the purpose of food, friend. Food is your energy source. <laughs> Somebody said it in the chat. Food is your energy source. When you eat food, it's just like going out into the sunlight. When you eat food, you should have energy. You're fueling your body. So if your food isn't fueling your body, then it's probably not the best food to put into your body. We're going to go deeper in that a little later. So then what gives you energy? It's the summertime right now. Here in Florida, it's practically always the summer, which is exactly why I moved here because I love the heat. I love being outside. But what gives you energy? Like, do you like to go to the water? Do you like being outside? Do you like spending time with your family and friends? Now with this, again, I'm your best friend for this moment. 
There are some family members that will take your energy and not give you back an ounce of it. Be mindful of those and be very intentional, uh, intentional about how you spend time with them. Knowing who those family members are and who those friends are can make or break your energy and focus throughout the day. It's no judgment. It's nothing against them. It has everything with you managing your energy for the day so you can do what you're called to do. So you can serve your team. So you can serve your patients. So you can be a good leader. So you can think clearly and problem solve and mediate and figure out how to optimize your EHR and come up with a new PDSA so you can be more efficient in the workplace. You need energy to do that good work. It doesn't just come out of anywhere. You are the, the source. You are the person that's doing that work. So you have to be filled and fortified appropriately so you can get it done. Rest and relaxation. When is your rest day? When do your friends and your family members know today is my day? For me, it's Saturday. My people know Saturday is my Sabbath. The answer is no to everything. If I decide last minute that I want to do something, that's totally on me. I'm going to give work what I have Monday through Friday. Saturday, I'm doing nothing. It's not a pretty sight up in here. I'm absolutely vegged out and lounging. So Sunday, Saturday, Oh, thank you, Tanisha. Bless you. I'm happy you're encouraged. So whatever your day is, and it's, again, all of this is very unique to you. So I want you to get this information and go back and sit with it. And if you don't have these practices in place, that's okay. Tomorrow's a new day. You can look at your calendar. And even if you have to schedule it out for three weeks, that's fine. If you say three weeks, I'm going to start taking X day, half a day to just rest and relax. Because my friend, with the S on your chest and all your superpowers, you are not a robot. You cannot just be plugged into the wall and charged up. You got to take care of you, your human body, so you can rest, so you can recover. So when you show up to work, you're grounded and you're calm and you're cool and you're collected so you can think, so you can produce, so you can get stuff done. So you're not easily agitated when someone sends you an email or asks you to do something or that patient who's standing at the counter on the wrong day of their appointment, mad at your patient reps because they thought it was Tuesday and it's really Wednesday, but you need to fix it. So now you got to bump your beautifully crafted schedule back to make this work because that's what you do. When you have your energy in order, when you have rested well, you can deal with that because it's going to happen every single day in healthcare. It happens. But when you take care of you, you're able to self-regulate your mind, your mood, and your emotions. So when those external things come your way, you can handle it with ease because you're well. And that's the purpose of all of this, to be well and live well so you can lead well. In your work, is it setting your soul on fire or does it feel like it's sucking everything out of you? Do you still have the energy and the motivation that you had from the beginning? And if not, how can you get it back? What is the piece of your job that you just love and you maybe have pushed it on the back burner because of other things? Is it time to delegate? Is it time to just not do it? Is it even a strategic priority anymore? So your work, our work should be purposeful and meaningful. I understand we have to work a job. We have to pay bills. All of that, yes, we have missions to achieve. I understand the reality of this situation, but the work that you raise your hand and say, yes, I accept this offer to do, it should connect to an intrinsic motivator, which means that's something within, within inside of yourself that motivates you. It's not money, it's not anything external, it's all within you. What is it that you talk about at work that you train? What topics do you facilitate? What part of the day? What part of the patient experience that you absolutely love? Is there a way that you could put more of that into your routine? Because that's giving you energy. That's lighting you up. So then when you do go to do some more daunting, boring, not so exciting task, it's fine because you're lit up from what you love. That's how you find the regulation of life, not just work, but of life. So the last principle is all tasks are not created equal. There are gonna be some tasks that require a different amount of energy than others. 
If you are in the financial space, I don't know if we have any finance people here. Finance people love numbers. They can crank them out, spreadsheets, the credits and the debits and all of that good jazz, and they're cool. From other people sitting and dealing with a spreadsheet all day long is exhausting, but you have to do it because you have to track this data. That's a different type of energy. It's a different amount of energy because you're pressing through your natural excitement and your natural motivators. And then there are other tasks that's going to just require a different type of focus. Like some things, now we cannot multitask. I hope we all know that. The brain cannot single, cannot be 100% focused on anything other than one single task. We attempt to do it. You may seem like you do it well, that's fine, but the brain has to be single focused for it to give it 100% attention. So when you think about the work that you have to do, some things you can maybe sit and eat and read and review, other stuff you have to be head down. Phone on do not disturb, office door closed, getting 100% invested in what's in front of you. If there are any grant writers on here, you can relate. When you're writing those narratives, it is head down. No distractions. You have to be focused. So all of your tasks require a different amount of energy to get it done and a different amount of time, obviously. Your ability to adjust your time, commitment, and energy will lead to your success and less stress. How many of you are guilty of cramming what literally is a 60 minute task into about 25 minutes? If you're guilty, just say me in the chat. How many of you procrastinate, wait to the last minute and you know you really needed a whole hour, like a, pow a strong, powerful 60 minutes? And yeah, no comment, come in the comment. We, we, are, we are freeing ourselves after today. We will make it happen and then how about those people? I am in recovery, so now I can laugh at you. How about those people that say, I work better under pressure? Remember, we best friends. Don't get mad at me. You work better under the pressure that you created for yourself because you have no choice because you have to get it done. It's okay, friend. We are all healing today. You, we do... There is a level of good stress that motivates us to lean in and really get it done. We kick out adrenaline and not cortisol, which is a stress hormone, right? So that's essentially what we're trying to say when we say we work better under stress. But more often than not, you've just created a construct to where you're down to the wire and you have no other choice. Take back your choices. Imagine working on something, actually being able to do a first draft, step away from it and come back and finish strong. And you can actually spark that creativity. Creativity really needs time. Creativity needs for you to be able to sit back, not look at the screen, gaze out a window or stare in your waiting room and just see what comes to your subconscious mind. You cannot produce that level of creativity if you're typing fast, looking at the clock, getting irritated at everybody that call or text you or come through your door with a problem. Give yourself the time and grace that you need to be great. If you plan accordingly, you can make it happen. I have an executive that I coach and they bought a new building. And for whatever reason, the front of her office, like the admin office, everyone has glass walls. So there is no privacy. And I'm just like, whose idea was this? Like in, a, in some world of architecture, it's beautiful. And the world of working at a health center and being an executive in the admin office and need to do work is not a good idea. So we come up with some tactics to where she can put a sign on her door, a sign right in front of her window, reposition her computer to look away. Because if not, when people see you, hey, got a minute? Hey, real quickly. Hey, one question. We know how it goes. So remember that all of the work that you have to do is not created equal. So be mindful of how much time you really need and how much time you want to give it and what level of energy you're going to need to get it done. And then prioritize. So here's how you prioritize the work, because if you're like me, you have a to-do list or whether it's digital or print or digital or handwritten goal alignment, what needs to be done, what needs to be achieved and why. With the work that you do, regardless of your role, whether you're a leader, executive, CEO, front desk, referral specialist, training, development, whatever you are, you are working towards some goals, team goals, department goals, strategic goals, HRSA goals, whatever the case may be. The work that you're doing should be getting you there. You'll often hear people say your North Star, your guiding light, whatever name you want to give it, is what you're doing at any moment in time getting you closer to that goal. And why? Because there should be alignment. 
oftentimes in the space of community health, we say yes to everything because we're champions, we're awesome, and we want to get it done. But when you say yes to one thing, you're inadvertently saying no to another because you only have so much time throughout the day. You only have so much bandwidth and you only have so much resources. So as you look at everything that's on your plate right now, prioritize to make sure it's in alignment with your goals. And then the urgency of it, what's due now? This here, even in the absence of these other two, if you just focus on what do I need to get done now? There's a project management principle. Um, if there are any PMPs on the line, you could say it far more beautifully and accurately than I can. But essentially, the input of one thing is necessary for the output of another thing. So if there is a grant that's due and you're responsible for pulling some numbers, getting some patient data or whatever the case needs to be done for your colleague to submit that grant, your input is directly impacting their output. So that's urgent. We don't want to hold anyone up. And yes, there will be times where we need grace. There will be times where we forget, where we said yes to many things to where we just miss it. Like it will happen because we're human. But the key is when you look at everything on your plate, when you look at your task list right now, your work management tool, a sticky note, a Kleenex, wherever you have it, because I hope it's not all up here, hint, hint, hack, get it out of your head and on paper or digitize somewhere. When you look at everything, what needs your attention right now? What is due right now? And then focus on that thing so you can get it done. And then the third one is importance. What's most important? There is a book by Greg McEwen, M-C-K-E-O-W-N. I don't know how to say that, but it's called Essentialism, the, the Disciplined Pursuit of Doing Less. I believe it's the sub subtitle, but it's Essentialism. And he teaches the acronym or not. It's not an acronym. What is it called when you take the first letters of a word? Initialism. I think that's the word. He has an initialism for the word when, and it's what's important now. Across. I cannot say that word. Acrostic? Is that correct? Acrostic. You got it. Okay, good. <laughs> what does it mean? That's when you take the first letter of the word? Yeah. Thank you, I, Susan. I'm sorry. Y'all know. I just, these, we're family. We're talking here. We're working through some stuff. So acrostic. These poetry. are great. Yes, acrostic. Thank you. That's new. I got to make sure I save that and get it in my brain. But when you want to win each day, you want to win the morning, you want to win the afternoon, we want to win in life. So what's important now? So this is how you prioritize. There will always be something to do. We know that. Cool. That does not mean we have to operate in a high level of stress all day, every day. Prioritization, being honest about the time and energy that is necessary to get work done. So breathe through that. How do you use your time at work? Whether you're going into the office or you're working from home or you're a hybrid, how are you using your time? Well, here are what a few people are doing. Senior managers are spending 23 hours a week in meetings. 23 hours a week. The average person works 40 hours a week. So that's over half of your time at work in meetings. Employees spend between 30 to 44% on social, for 44 minutes on social media. Yeah, it is sad. It's a lot of meetings that take place. And I get it. Some meetings are necessary. A lot of the ones that you were sitting in are not. Let's just be honest. And that's a whole nother conversation about leaning out your meetings and having a psychologically safe work environment so people can say, what is the point of this meeting? And we need to stop it. That's a dip. Call me in to talk about that one. Employees spend 30 to 44 minutes on social media. Now, I have seen organizations where their IT department has the firewalls blocked to where you can't go on social platforms when you're on the network, but they're still on their phone if they're just using their own data. Now, social media, this includes LinkedIn. LinkedIn has now, you know, it, it is very much a professional platform. I love it. It's, it's very beneficial, but it's still social media. You can still get caught up scrolling and talking and watching videos and looking at people live stream, whatever the case may be. And only 17% of people track their time. You know who is phenomenal at tracking time? Lawyers. They're going to track it and they're going to bill you for all the things, regardless of what it was. Everything's an hour. And for those of you in my compliance people, if you're on the line, you know for sure how that works. Executives, you know, lawyers track their time because they're billable hours. 
Can you imagine if the workplace turned into billable hours? If you had to account for what you did every hour, then send an invoice to your finance department to get paid? Just think about it. Don't answer out loud. In December 2020, the year of COVID, the term employee monitoring was the most searched because leaders wanted to know, okay, my people are at home. They're working remotely. How can I watch them to make sure that I'm not just paying them to scroll social media or sit there and pet their cat? So leaders and your team members want you to use your time effectively, but that's not always the case. And employees feel that meetings are the biggest waste of time in the workplace. I've worked before. I agree. I now go into organizations and help them improve. I agree. Again, some meetings are necessary. More often than not, they really just don't need to be happening. Look at your goals. What do you need to do to get to your goals? Have a target and work towards that. So what this means is that meetings and distractions take away productivity. The root word of productivity is produce. So when we're working, regardless of what it is that we're doing, if it's directly engaging with a patient, if we're training our team members, if we're developing something, we should be producing. There should be something that comes from how we're spending our time. It's the same in your personal life. If you're working every day with your children and you're doing after school training, um, after school homework with them and reading and developing and flashcard, you're producing a better reader. You're producing a better student. So when you're productive, something should be produced. So then you can ask yourself at the end of the day, was my day productive? What did you produce? Clearing through your inbox is not productive. Now, please remember you are more than what you produce for someone else. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's not about, we're not just about what can you do? Your valuation isn't, it's not the value of you as to what you do. But when you're being productive, if I'm going to have a productive day, what does that mean? Start with the end in mind. What is it that you want to produce to say that you were productive? And do that quick check-in at night to see what did I produce? And most people don't monitor their time to know what know how it's being used. Now, this isn't um, something that happens normally in the workplace. I have a tool that I've used in my coaching practice to where I have my clients track their hours for five days straight, and it's in 30-minute increments, so they can look back and see, okay, what's sucking up your time? Where are you overspending or underspending your time? It's literally like I actually got the idea from a lawyer a paralegal, because they're when they're researching and looking at laws and doing all of these things, they really want to be mindful of their time that you're going to bill you from. So most people don't monitor it. I have that resource. My email's on the last slide. Shoot me a note and just say time tracker. I'm happy to send it to you. And leaders want people to spend their time working. Now, leaders, I know for a fact, do not want you to burn out. They do not want you to be stressed out, but they do want you to achieve the mission. And as a team member, you should know the role that you're contrib contributing and the role that you're playing in achieving that mission. So when you're at work, Jim Rohn has a quote, when you're in the office, be in the office. And when you're at the beach, be at the beach. So it's compartmentalization so you can be great. When you're at work, be leaned in, dialed in, two feet in to working and getting it done. Take your necessary breaks, get your fresh air, eat away from your desk, all of that, absolutely. But then work when it's time to work. So when you get off of work, you can be fully present at home and fully present with your family and fully present with the things that you enjoy. So how can you manage your time and energy better? Now that we're aware of what's happening, what's taking, you know, the things that take our time throughout the workday and what it, what it means to be productive, how can we manage it better? Well, we want to first know what's taking and giving you time and energy. Throughout the course of the day, there are some things that are 100% stealing your time, for lack of a better word. So here are a few that's taking your time, possibly. You don't have a plan for the day. You're just winging it, as people say. And it's one of those things where you can go into the office or you start the day and you don't clearly define what you will achieve. And then it's like chaos. Everything is coming. Everyone has a problem. You need to fix this. One email to come in and completely derail you. And then the end of the day, you're tired. You're mentally spent. And then what? What have you gotten done that's going to help you get closer to your goals? Having unnecessary meetings. I beat that horse. Mindless scrolling. Repeatedly checking emails. This one here. We are such a dialed in society. We are stuck in our inbox if we aren't careful. 
there is a way that you can block your time to where it's strictly focusing on emails and then other times when you're working. And if you're like me, I don't have any notifications on my computer or my phone. Nothing pops up, nothing vibrates, nothing makes a sound. So if you're working on something, you can minimize or close out Outlook because everything that comes to your inbox is going to be there when you get back. So give yourself the, the uh, fighting chance of getting through what you want to work on so you can be single focused by closing out your email or blocking time. Yes, for teams, absolutely, because teams will pop up. You can turn the pop up off. You can turn it off to where it doesn't show you that you have an unread message. All of this can be done in your settings. You just have to go in and make it work for you. So daydreaming and daydreaming is different from thinking or taking a break or visualizing. Daydreaming is like when you realize it, like, oh, where did I just go? And sometimes it happens, but just be mindful of it. Uh, one of my clients sent me a gift of an hourglass and you can get something like that and set it and they have five minute hourglass, little small one. You can be intentional about just letting your mind wonder because you're making time for it. You're not just losing time by daydreaming. And of course, gossiping and complaining is a complete waste of time. And it's such an energy taker. It's, it's counterproductive. It's one thing to talk about a problem and look for a solution. It's another thing to keep stating what's not working and who sucks and everything that's wrong just because. It's not good for the person that's doing it, nor is it good for the person that's having to listen to it. And then those got a minute moments where people send you a quick note or stop in or call you or teams you and say got a minute. If you don't have a minute, say you don't have a minute right then, and then schedule time or say you'll get back to them when you're finished. Again, this is one of those um, areas that the more psychologically safe your work environment is, the easier it is to do this. Because some people are terrified to say not right now. And that shouldn't be the case at work. We should be comfortable and safe enough to say, I'm working on something because I wanna finish it, or I'm actually in deep thought or whatever the case may be, can I get back to you? So being mindful of people who say, oh, I just need five minutes or you got a quick set. We don't ever just take a set. So starting with that plan, being clear on what is it that I need to do today? What do I need to achieve today? It'll help you manage how you're getting distracted. If you don't have a vision and goals, you're just doing whatever, going through the day-to-day -day motion. And some days, like, let's be honest, you can start with a beautiful plan. I am not unrealistic. You can start with a beautiful plan. You can have your list of what you want to get done, and then something can happen. We know that's the case. We can prepare for those by having that clear vision and goals, because once you get taken away to deal with whatever needs your time, just re-anchor back in what you know you're working on. But if you don't have anything to work on, when you come from dealing with the problem, putting out the fire, um, saving the day, and then you come back, you're like, okay, now what do I do? You're distorted, you're, 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 you're disheveled. But if you are very clear on saying, these are my priorities for today, if you get pulled away for three hours, four hours, come right back to it, pick right back up. An energy taker is lack of rest and adequate sleep. You just can't perform optimally if you're tired. Again, you're not a robot, you're a human. You need that real energy, not caffeinated artificial energy. A cup of coffee, I'm not, I'm gonna drink a cup of coffee every morning. I'm not anti-caffeine, but it's not your natural energy source to where you should be dependent upon it. And then not having um, an, a, a healthy diet. This isn't drink green smoothies, eat vegetables all day. This is putting real food in your real body so it can give you real energy. That's healthy eating. And we know what real food is and real beverages. Another energy taker is not having clear boundaries. Are you in other people's lane? In the military, we have a, a term called, when you're on the range, when we're shooting our weapon, stay in your lane and watch your target because we're so close to everyone and you're trying to get center mass to your target. But if you look away by just an inch, you're in someone else's lane. And as you look through the barrel of a rifle, you don't have that much wriggle room. So we say, stay in your lane and watch your target. In the workplace, obviously, we want to collaborate. We want to cross-pollinate. But then we also want to have clear boundaries. So Sally, no, this is your, your, your lane of focus. Jesse, this is yours. Uh, April, whatever the case may be. We don't want it to be blurred. And it also will help you manage your workplace stress when people know what you are here to do. And they don't call on you for everything. So healthy boundaries are good in work and in life. Yes, fly your own plane. I love it. 
And physical activity can take your energy and overexertion and the lack of. So if you overdo it, you're going to be tired. And if you don't move your body enough, you can be tired. So be mindful of how much you're moving. The rule of thumb, 30 minutes a day of physical activity. And they've gotten that so succinct to where you can do 30 minutes a day of chores. Uh, I recently learned that just moving your body, actively cleaning your house for 30 minutes, and that's physical activity. Or you can go for a walk, or if you like to go to the gym, lift weights, ride your bike, swim, play with the dog, whatever the case may be. Moving your body for 30 minutes a day improves your cardiovascular health. So what is giving you back your time and giving you back energy? A good night's sleep. Starting tonight, we are shooting for eight hours if we physically can. Minimize the screen time before you get ready to go to bed. Make it dark, cool the place down, and sleep well. Positive and uplifting conversation. Again, who you're talking to is part of your diet. Like your healthy diet, as you see next, food, audio, and visual. What are you putting into your eyes and your ears? Are you watching uplifting and interesting and fun shows or is it doom and gloom? And after you look at the news, you're sad. All of that personal preference. But what you take in, that's through your ears and through your eyes. It's part of your diet. And you want to be mindful of what you consume because in some capacity, it's going to come back out. Because as my technicians know, garbage in, garbage out. Whatever goes inside of you is going to come out. It's going to come out in your patience, in your stress, and in your conversation. Another energy giver is your inner inner work, your spiritual practices. What do you do just for you in the privacy of your own home? What do you do to keep yourself fortified? What is it that is, regardless of what life is bringing you, what can you lean on to know and remind yourself that it's going to pass and that you're going to be okay and that it's going to work out for you? So doing that is a daily practice. That's what no one can see, but it's the driving force behind your values and your beliefs and how you interact with other people. And your movement, that gives you energy. Getting up to your desk, um, something as simple as if you're able to get a desk that stands or if you can walk around, change where you sit, put a timer. If you have an Apple Watch, you can set it for every 40 minutes, I believe, that it can tell you it's time to stand up and just move your body. In NLP, we call that a pattern interrupt. So you can do a pattern interrupt when someone's talking or a pattern interrupt in your day. If you've been head down working and before you know it, two or three hours have passed by, you can do a pattern interrupt and just walk, walk the building, go outside. Or if you can't, go into a room and just lift your knees if you're physically able, move your arms. It's still movement. Whatever that looks like, if you're physically able to bend over and touch your toes, do jumping jacks. Again, it's respected to what your body can do and as you're able, but the key is that movement gives you energy, especially after you get through eating. Another energy giver is a calendar blocking. So blocking your calendar is saying like, for those of you that know when your peak performance time is, block that time so it's your protected time. You don't have to schedule anything other than you. What is it that you want to work on, but no one can send, put you in a meeting or take your time away from you? Obviously, if it's 10 o'clock at night or 4 o'clock in the morning, you don't have to worry about that. But block your calendar. If you have something to work on, set an appointment with yourself and then keep the appointment with yourself and be focused to complete the task. And that way you don't have the feeling of self-betrayal thereafter. So again, this may not be something that you can do every day depending on your role, but blocking your calendar is taking ownership of your time so you can be focused. And that's what I call DFT, dedicated focus time. So because I'm an entrepreneur and I work from home, I use this, um, it's not an app, this website called Focusmate. And with Focusmate, I log on and I can have a virtual working session with someone from all around the world. And we just sit there and we, we don't technically stare at each other, but our cameras are on. And you start, you say, you can sign up for a 50 minute block, 75 minute, whatever the case may be. And it's like, hi, hi, what are you working on? Okay, then we go into silence and we work. And then at the end of it, you just check in and see what you did. Did you get the task done? How far did you make it? Do you need to have another session? But it's dedicated focus time on one task, laser focus, finger focus. And it is amazing how I can get work accomplished by just keeping myself focused on the one thing. And if you work in a health center, it's possible to block your calendar so no one can take your time, put a note on the door, let everyone know, check in as you need to see if anything is needed. But if it's not something urgent, 
Let your team know you're working on something and then you commit to yourself to be focused on the task at hand until completion. And then a few other things that give you energy, your day and week planning, <clears throat> excuse me, Jim Rohn says, y'all see, I like Jim Rohn. He says, don't start the day until you plan, until you finish it. Don't start the week until you finish it. So he's saying, before you go into it, know what you need to get done. Strategic thinking gives you energy because when there is so much to do, do you have a strategy for it? One of my clients work at USAA and she said something that has not been able to leave my mind. And she was talking about a dating app, but she said, everything needs a strategy. And it really does. There's a strategy to how you get ready in the morning. There's a strategy to how you're raising your kids, whether you mapped it out or not, but there's a strategy behind it. So taking time for strategic thinking, how can I come up with a plan to take action on it, to execute it and hit my measures of success? That takes time to do strategic thinking. Your productive habits give you energy, your morning routine, exercise, time chunking. Time chunking is similar to calendar blocking, but that's just saying it's more... If you're going to give yourself 40 minutes, like if you look at your calendar and you have 60 minutes, an hour uh, of unaccounted for time, take 40 minutes and focus on something and then use the other 20 minutes for whatever. But it's chunking that time so you can just be dialed in. And then lastly, using metrics to measure progress. So if you're using a metric, so if you sit down to work, what is it that you want to achieve? Is it that you want to complete the task? Is it, do you want to put a check saying it's done? Do you want to put it in yellow because it's 50%? Like when you're able to look and see your progress, you're motivated to keep going or see if you got derailed for whatever reason and then know where to pick back up. So put a measurement on whatever you're working on it for grants. You typically work like that anyway, saying that 40% of it's completed, 50%, whatever the case may be. Managing your work that you do, it actually helps because you can always see where you are. So if, you're half, uh, if you have something and you're almost complete and you have some time, then go ahead and knock that out so you can check, line through, delete, and get it done. And then take a moment and be proud of yourself for completing it. Because let's be honest, we don't always finish what we start. And that can take our energy constantly having incomplete tasks, so many things to do, so many open projects. So we want to get as many wins under our belt as possible, as often as we can. So how can you manage it all better? Be aware of your energy givers and energy takers. And I want you to think like, is there anybody that you talk to, any food that you eat, anything that you watch where you're depleted and unmotivated in the process or afterwards? And then conversely, what's lighting you up? What's giving you energy? What's actually putting a smile on your face that's coming from within? Uh, again, like where do you get lost in time? Procrastination will drain you. It's emotional. It's you saying that you're going to do something and you don't keep the word to yourself. So you have that feeling of betrayal. We don't want to procrastinate. We're all guilty of it. I get it. But it really impacts you and takes away your energy. So to set yourself up for success, don't say you're going to do everything. Say, think about what you can realistically do and don't do too much of it. You only have so much time in the day. You only have so much energy. Do one thing at a time and don't try to take on everything. The power of no. And sleep good every night that you can. And I know some nights aren't going to be as good as others. But how can you prepare yourself to get in bed at a decent time, sleep well, and arise at a time that works for you? And then don't overthink. You're not going to be able to take all these hacks and, and strategies and do start tomorrow. Don't overthink it. What can you do right now? to improve your well-being? What can you do right now to sleep better? What can you do right now to clear some things off your plate? Who can you call right now and say, you know, I did say that I was going to be able to do this, but after looking at my priorities, I'm not going to be able to do it in a way that will serve both of us well. Can I make a recommendation for you or do you have another person? Don't overthink life. One step, one moment at a time. And then disconnect. Give your eyes and brain a break. Step away from the screen, put the phone down, shut it off and just not look at anything and move your body. It is so easy to doom scroll and look at TV and binge watch. Do that for entertainment. Yes, have fun, but be mindful of how long you're sitting versus how long you're moving your body. So as I prepare to land this plan, I was taught this plane. I was taught years ago, the power of two. When you start your day, what are two things that you can strive to achieve? 
And some days two may be too much, but let's start with two. And with these two things, how will they have the greatest impact and the greatest result? And then be very specific on what you need to do, like see it through its reasonable conclusion. Conclusion. So you can see at the end of this, I will have achieved what? So now you know what you're working towards. Power of two, two things every day, two things. Using task management tools inside your Outlook is a Microsoft planner. Asana is a free tool. You can put your uh, list down. You can assign it to people, put them on Teams. You got OneNote, Monday.com, or a good old faithful Excel spreadsheet. So there are options, but be mindful of task atrophy. That's where you'll look at it and you haven't looked at it in weeks and tasks haven't been touched. You forgot that you put it on there. You're not updating it. So use whichever one works for you and then look at it often. And then throughout the day, my friend, I want you to have mindful moments and ask yourself, is this activity giving or taking away from me? If you're in the middle of a conversation, if somebody's in your door or on team that you're looking at them, and your brain is thinking about what else you should be working on. Pattern interrupt, get your time back. Or simply saying, is this the most important thing right now? Put a sticky note, put a reminder, have your phone go off at one o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever the case may be, and just check in with you. Is this most important right now? Or am I doing something because it's easy or because it's, you know, it's, it's fun versus I need to get it done because it's due day after tomorrow. Just have a mindful moment with yourself. So my final thoughts and tips for you, conduct a time audit. Again, if you want that resource, it's april at aprillewis.com. I'm happy to send it to you and just track it. No judgment. You just want to track it because like old Peter Drucker said years ago, you can't manage what you don't measure. When you put numbers in front of you and when you see, oh my goodness, I am checking my email six hours out the day, it motivates you to move different. So just check, even if you look at your calendar now, how many blocks are taken for meetings? And then when are you going to do the work for the follow-ups, for the meetings, for all the things that you talked about? Just saying, manage you well. It all starts with you. It starts with how you eat. It starts with how you move. It starts with how you think, how you self-regulate. It starts with you. So I encourage you to manage yourself well. Use those task management tools. You all have a lot to do. We all do. And it's good, fun work. I mean, we're in healthcare. I, I, I'm not directly in healthcare, but I support healthcare professionals. We make people well. Is that not the most epic thing ever? We directly are connected to people feeling better, being able to go home and feel good when they talk to their family. We're making communities healthier. You're seeing people that you are their only option to get to a doctor. So use a tool so you can get this beautiful, life-changing work done and not to the detriment of yourself. And your time is valuable. So take care of what you value. If you have jewelry, your children, your pet, the things that you value, you guard it closely. You pay attention to it. You protect it. Sometimes you'll fight over it. Not literally, just saying so your time, it is truly your greatest asset. You know, in the workplace, your people are, but in life, time, because it's, what are you doing with it? It's just going to be going. So what are we doing with the, the days and the moments that we have? And don't forget to prioritize. Everything is not priority number one. Not one, nor one A. It's one, two, three. <laughs> so prioritize. What's most important? What's urgent? Pull it up, put those things at the top and get them done when you have your highest amount of energy. And never, ever forget that you got this. Just stay present in the moment and take it one moment at a time. Thank you all so much. I'm going to hand it back over to our rock star facilitators and see what am I supposed to do next? Okay, April, thank you so much for that invigorating presentation. I know I learned so much. And there was so much engagement in the chat. We've got some time for a little bit of Q&A. So if that's okay, I'll just go through the questions that we have and then um, we get some answers. Um, but before we do that, April, I wanna know if it's possible for you to send me the time tracker. We had a lot of folks ask for it in the chat and we can actually, um, I can hand that, get that to Megan and she can get that into the White Cement Education platform. So then everyone who's registered for this can have access to that, if that's okay. Yes, actually when I said it, my brain was like, oh, they could send it out easier. So yes, I will get that <laughs> to everybody. Thank you for that option. <laughs> 
Absolutely, absolutely. So the first question is this. I wonder how this talk could be adjusted for clinicians and clinician support staff. I feel like they have less control over their schedule and interruptions. What advice and tips do you have for someone in that type of a role where they're more scheduled, less, you know, less of an admin or, or, you know, sort of operations kind of staff? Yes. No, that's a phenomenal question because it, let's be honest, clinical versus non-clinical, the days are totally different. And so my advisement is to work with the, the construct that you have, dot, 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 that you have developed. So we know the schedule, right? Whatever your schedule look like for your clinicians, whether you got your 15 minute quick visit, 20 minutes, um, whatever that's set. So that's like fixed. So what can we navigate in and out of their admin time? It's essentially the same thing. When a clinician has admin time, yes, we want them to close charts. You know, we want them to follow up on referrals, prescriptions, all of that. But then what, where can you add time for them to do projects and to create and to have those peer-to-peer -peer conversations? So start with pulling out what's fixed, which is their schedule. And then from their admin time, we know what they need to focus on. And then from there, we want to advise them to what else is important. What else can you focus on so you can do your other work very well? Because clinicians, they, they um, the CEUs, but the professional development to stay on top of clinical measures and how they can treat patients better, they need time to do that too. And we really don't want clinicians going home closing charge. I, I know it, sometimes it happens, you can't get away with it. But they are, they should be able to go home and be present with their family too. So then that's where you want to peel back the onion layers and see why aren't we as efficient as possible. And you know, in community health centers, it can be a multitude of things. It can be the EHR not being um, customized for your practice. It can be your patient panels. It can be a shortage of workforce. So just take time again, make time to see, let's, let's autopsy the operation. Like, where do we just need to stop the bleed? Because you're bleeding from somewhere if they don't have any time and if they have to go home and do work. And then once you autopsy it, tune in, fix it. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. What is your stance on multitasking? I know it's not the best, but it feels so necessary sometimes and sometimes feels more productive. Uh, it's that, yeah, no, don't do it. And let me tell you what, because I really had to like, see in my brain, I used to think that I could multitask and you can multi do, you can multi have activity, but when it comes to, so you can be doing multiple things at one time. Yes. However, neither one of those things are getting 100% of your attention and focus because the brain can only focus on one thing with everything. Like literally, if you're, have y'all gotten to the point in life to where you can't talk and text anymore? I used to be able to do that. Now things are off and I can't. So my stance is don't do it because it's leaking energy. And what I mean by that is if you look at, I'm trying to get in the camera. So let's say all of your energy for the day is in a bowl and every meeting, every person you talk to, everything you're working on, you're pouring out of your bowl. So if you're trying to pour out at two times, that's more energy versus a steady stream to just do one thing, get it done, and then move on to the next thing. It's like saving gas on cruise control versus going up and down, kicking out different spurts of gas versus let's just ride. So my stance is to don't do it because it's not healthy and it slows you down. So try it. Let me know how it goes. Like try it to be single focused, but it's been proven with myself and people that I work with that they just get work done when you stop trying to do two things at once and be single focused. Okay, thank you for that. So, um, and I believe this comment came when we were talking the last question about um, clinicians and clinical support mm -hmm. staff about, you know, really making sure that they have that protected admin time and really helping, um, you know, focusing within those admin times. Um, so um, Tanisha said, this is where leadership supervision and coaching comes in. And actually I was gonna mention that, but that um, they made that comment. And so I just wanted to say that um, and how yeah. that's really critical for that. Like it's leadership. Yeah, and that's why I kept, y'all see, I kept dropping the bomb of psychological safety. Um, and that is really, really important. And let me make sure I say this the right way. 
if you are a leader, be okay with doing things differently. Listen mm -hmm. to your people, especially your frontline people, especially the people that are doing the work. Yes, you do the work. Yes, we know all of that's happening. But the people that's there at that check-in counter, that's turning that light on, that's looking at those patients, that's putting the information in the system, that's calling to get the referral, like they got good primary data for you. If any of you are in marketing, you know there's primary and secondary data. Primary da data is coming directly from the source. Secondary is from research or something or from, um, from a third party. The people that are running your operation can tell you the best about your operation. So as mm. a leader, be okay, even if it means like, oh, I got it wrong or, oh, I actually don't know. Or you know what? We've been doing it this way for so long. We need to blow this up and build it again. Like I work with so many leaders and it's just like, friend, it's okay. You got the title. You make the money. You have the influence. Trust your people. Let They got this. Mm. Like they really do have this and let go. And it's a lot of ego. I, I, we still best friends, but it's a lot of ego sometimes in leadership. <laughs> Look, Tanisha, like, yes, it's like we are here to serve and we can do it better collectively and as a united front and no single person has all the answers. So leverage your people, link arms with your people. And like my mentor told me, you will never go wrong in healthcare if you keep the patient in the center. And I got that from Peter Levinis. I'm gonna call his name. He is in South Carolina. He said, you will never go wrong if every decision you make, every goal you set, the patient is in the middle. Mm. That's great. I love that. Okay, just looking um, at some more things that came in the chat. Um, Shirley says, for 50 years in practice, the same issues are here. Time, documentation, et cetera, et cetera. How can we transform our work? If we don't, it will never happen. Oh, the truth was just spoken. <laughs> what was that, Sherry? Like, that is so, if you do, I have a coin right here. I don't know. If nothing changes, nothing changes. I don't know if you can see it. I got this coin at an event. If you keep doing the same thing, you'll keep getting the same result. We have mm. to do it differently. And I know people say that a lot, but some principles are just timeless. So 50 years, you got 50 years worth of data. Disrupt that data and do things differently mm. and bring in the new, some new data set. And then now you can compare it and you can see which one gives the better outcome, which one produces what we want to produce. You, but if you keep saying the same, you're, it's like you keep, um, you know, meditation is good. Like meditation comes from like how cows digest food in their three stomach chambers. So you should take it in. They bring it up. It's gross, but they redo it. So meditating on something, you want to stay in that space. That's good with life spiritual practices, not at work. We do not want to keep recycling the same way of doing things because nothing in healthcare or with human beings is just the same that it was 50 years ago. How you track data, how you communicate, how you engage, how you receive patient satisfactions. So if the world around you is changing and evolving and you're still doing the same, you're likely getting left and left behind. So just use the time, say, and you can do it in an encouraging way because again, I know most of the pain points inside healthcare organizations. This isn't just FQACs, it's uh, payers, health insurance companies, private practice, specialty, like it's, healthcare in general. You mm -hmm. can get very comfortable doing things a different way and the fear of the unknown will paralyze you. But the only way you will get a different response is if you change what you do. So at the least, just try it. Try for a little while, say what you're looking for, what's going to be the metrics, like we do PDSAs, and then look at both of them. Whichever one produces what you really want to produce, go with that one. But if not, you just got option one producing the results of option one from option one. Disruption. Awesome. Great. Yes. Thank you. Okay, next question. Managing emails. Any tips or tricks? They are so distracting. They are. It, 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 it's so much. And that is actually one of separate of like, how can I better manage my time? That question, managing emails comes up the most. So what I say is, and if you've heard me speak before, you probably heard me use this analogy. Um, it's called the inbox. And that is people coming in to your box. So control your box. 
set time for which you want to check emails. And then if you're not actively engaged in emails, close it down. Now the volume, you can, again, peel back the onion layers. Do you have a, a culture of over-communication? Do you have a culture to where people reply all just to say thank you? Oh my goodness. Do you have a culture to where people are so terrified to make a decision that they want to email and ask for a moment to talk about? Like, again, go deep and see what actually the root cause of it is. But at the bare minimum, what you can control is how often you engage in it. So even if you're averaging 100 emails a day, if you say, you know, between 2 and 2.45 is when I'm going to check emails, between 9 and 9.45, whatever works for you, do it then. And if you really want to get fancy with it, you can put an auto responder on that say, thank you for your message. If this is urgent, feel free to give me a call. Otherwise, I'll respond. You can put your time. You can put within 24 to 48 hours, however you want to make it work. But it's your box to manage it. And then again, get to the root cause if it's a culture issue within your organization. And then just take care of you. Like emails will take all of your time. And so for me, like turn not even minimize X. Close out all those open emails you got at the bottom where you're telling yourself you're going to respond to it or read the blog. Close everything out so then you don't get a notification. Set time. Lean in when you're lean into it when you're focused on it. Otherwise, just know that it's going to be there when you return. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So Mike in the chat said that Outlook, if you use Outlook for your email, has a new React feature, which has a great way to cut down on those. Thank you. Great job, et cetera, email. So yeah. that's, um, that, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Mike. I didn't know that. Um, I just and wanted to read a comment. Not yeah. to cut you off. And it depends on the version. So Mike, I'm happy that you said that because it's like how we react to text messages and um, social media posts. You can heart, like, or whatever. So Mike, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's the latest most recent version of the new Outlook 365. So it just, if you don't have it, then tell your IT department to uh, update you or upgrade. Um, but yes, that's a great tool to have. I'm happy you said that. Great, thank you for, and thank you for um, clarifying that about, you know, the version. Um, and then um, Tanisha also said, um, front lines are so significant. They are the ones that interface with customers. So workflow is so significant and a great place to start, um, yes. especially with front lines. Okay. Um, let's go here. These are great questions. Um, um, also too, so um, another uh, sort of comment question in the chat says, what do you do when you're at 10,000 emails waiting for you to look at? Oh, quit the job. No, I'm kidding. Don't say that. Take that out. <laughs> <of the record. laughs> no, um, it, it's still the same thing. <laughs> No, seriously, if you get it, who that? Shirley, call me, Shirley, because if you get that many emails, like we need to talk at all levels. But it's one of those things where a lot of leaders don't take vacations. Like, oh, if I go away, I got to come back and deal with everything. Or I, it's more problems when I leave and when, if I just stay. Well, first off, if you say that, you're professing it. So just be mindful of your words and what's coming out of your mouth and your belief system around your work environment, because we can create things. That's very philosophical, but I'm just saying, so be mindful of how you're looking at it. If you're blocking that time, it's still the same thing. So look at it in healthcare. Regardless of how many calls come through the day to schedule appointments, we still only have so many slots that we can see patients. So the volume will come in, but we can slap people at these hours. You got the times for your walk-ins, same day appointments, whatever that looks like. So do the same with how you manage your inbox. If you're going to give yourself an hour, in that hour, you may get to 32 of those 10,000. The next hour, we're going to work on 33 through. And then, of course, you can scan and you can use their mike i'm not sure what he does but if he's like a IT person or outlook guru you can set up rules to where you dump certain senders into a folder so obviously if your executive team is reaching out to you you maybe want to prioritize that or your project your project officer or either like your site managers it could be something going on at the site so you can set up rules but it really boils down to you managing it. If you want to scan through those 10,000, if it's nothing urgent, hot off the press, I need to respond. Cool. Go back to the top and just start working it. I love it. Just 
move on down the list. And we had some really great engagement in the chat. So um, there was a comment that um, someone said, I declare email bankruptcy bankruptcy every three to six months. And anything I haven't opened or responded to just gets put in an email bankruptcy date folder. And then someone else said, it does take some practice, but don't be afraid to help build a culture of an email does not necessitate an immediate response. Yes. Of course, it's easier said than done. Oh, it shouldn't be an ready. expectation that an email will be replied to in less than 12 to 24 hours. There should be other options for things requiring rapid or immediate responses. Um, and then there were some comments about like backlog comes from a lower priorities that drift sometimes for months. Um, and the starring helps. This person, um, Shirley, said that starring helps. Um, just helps. Um, just takes two hours to check spam. Um, and then, um, someone else shared that their personal email deleted the entire, um, box, which was 8,000 unread. It was the most liberating thing that's ever happened. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, and so then, um, Tanisha said, I believe you're speaking to the most important idea here. Be intentional in your work, create shortcuts and outlook is an easy place to start. Yes, intentionality. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm not sure whoever just said that, like, we move based on our intentions. Like, what's the, when you move with intention, and all of what I'm talking about is being intentional, being intentional with how you take care of yourself, being intentional with going to sleep, being intentional with waking up at a time that wake, works for you, being intentional about what you eat, what you drink. It is about intentionality because there for each one of us, there is a gravitational pull that's taking us to like lo a lower level than what we're capable of. There's a gravitational pull that wants you to procrastinate. There's a gravitational pull that wants you to always be annoyed and just wait to the last minute. It's a default behavior. But when you're intentional to say, I am going to be on the offense of my day and not the defense. So offense means I'm starting with clearly my power of two or my power of one, whatever works for you. And if and when you get pulled, go right back to that. But you were intentional about what was important because you've taken the time to think, is this getting me to my goals? What's urgent and what's important? So it's all about the front end of it so you can be successful. I, I'm operating off a term, um, mise en place. It's a French word that chefs use. It basically means before a chef goes to prepare a meal, they lay everything out on the table. So it's just ready with the food is chopped, the, the measured thing. All, I don't, you see, I don't cook from a recipe, but all whatever you do for those that cook from a recipe, you put it out on the table. So mise en plat is essentially saying everything is in place. So now I can cook. Let's live life like that. Like as best we can, put things in place, put systems in place. Most of the time we're doing the same thing over every day anyway. So put a system in place to be more efficient. Start your day with a clear vision. So if you get pulled, you come back, but don't put yourself. And that's what I mean by the offense. Go in, in control of the ball, in control of your calendar. And if you lose it, that's okay. You can recover and you know what basket you're going towards. So be intentional. I love whoever said that. Thank you so much. Because that's what it, the essence of all of this is intentionality and being able to recover when you get pulled away because you've intentionally set what you should be focused on. I love it. I love it. Well, that is a great note to wrap up on. Again, I love all the engagement and chat. So fun to see all of this just all these things that's sparking for folks and how they're really thinking about how they can be more intentional um, about things. And we just really appreciate you being here, April, to talk to us about managing our time and our energy and how that relates to um, our workplace, but also how, you know, it's just setting ourselves up um, it just as, as people as well. So um, again, April, thank you so much for being here. It's an, always an absolute pleasure to um, be with you, even if it's just in a virtual presence. Um, so what we're going to do now, um, and just as a reminder, um, we will put the um, time tracker in the Weitzman Education platform too. Um, so we'll follow up with that. Um, right now, we're going to go into a 10-minute break. So come back at 1.40 p.m. Eastern time, 10.40 p.m. Pacific time, and we, um, Gerard will be introducing our next speaker, Gary Campbell, so you don't want to miss that. So again, thank you so much to April for being here. So, so grateful um, that you are able to come and be with us today, um, and um, we will see everyone in 10 minutes.
at 1 40 um, Eastern. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Bless you. Bye. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to um, our culture transformation session. Uh, certainly, what a great session to follow uh, with April Lewis. Uh, appreciate all the engagement uh, with that discussion. Uh, my name is Gerard Jolly. I am the Director of Career Advancement Strategies with NAC. Uh, and we're excited uh, to bring you uh, this session on Johnson Health Center's culture transformation. Uh, most if not all of us would like to work for an employer uh, that highly values its employees and that demonstrate that uh, in the actions that they take as an employer. Uh, we wanna work for an employee that we choose to work for even when other opportunities exist. That is an employer of choice. And Johnson Health Center has achieved that designation officially. How did they do it? Uh, what's been involved in that? Uh, well, today we have with us the CEO of Johnson Health Center, uh, Gary uh, Campbell, who will introduce uh, momentarily. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit about, uh, about Gary as we have him here with us to share with us uh, what culture transformation took place through building a coaching culture at Johnson Health Center. Uh, Gary is the founder and owner of Impact to Lead and also the CEO of Johnson Health Center in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's been in that role since 2014, and he's driven on creating an environment that will bring joy and fulfillment to employees. Uh, Johnson Health Center became the first ever FQHC to achieve the Employee of Choice recognition in 2016. And in 2017, the center was named a great place to work. In 2018, a top 10 emerging small business in Central Virginia. And in 2019, the health center saw a record number of patients and by 2020 have become a provider of choice as nominated in a community survey. They have been uh, extraordinary. And so we're happy to hear from Gary and to hear what they've done to achieve this culture transformation to build a coaching culture. With that said, let's give our attention to Gary Campbell. Gerard, thank you so very much. Good to be here. And I mean, I get I get excited when, you know, when I hear these kind of things and it 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 just reminds me of how important the topics that there really is taking place in this summit, how relevant and timely they are for today, because uh, if things are a little different than they were probably four and five years ago, maybe maybe even three years ago coming out of COVID and all of the things that we saw. So lots of things are happening. And I did want to say that um, I, I know that I have really a, a tall order here following up April Lewis because uh, April, uh, I know she is high energy and high impact. So I know I've got to really amp the game up here when we talk about the culture and everything that we are working on. So it's good to be here. I want to thank you all. And we're going to crank right into it. I'm going to try to leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. Um, and hopefully we will be able to do that. So next slide, please. Now, this is me. I'm not going to spend a whole heck of a lot of time there. We did, uh, and this was not in the bio, but in 2022, we were named a best place to work again. So this is just some of the things that uh, we want to continue to, uh, to to really talk through and add and, and, and really why it's so important because at the very bottom of this bio uh, is clear on my why. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the why and the purpose because all of these things are tied into your coaching culture. And when you think about coach, uh, coaching culture, you're really just talking about how to build better relationships with the people you do life with each and every day. So next slide, please. All right. Okay. I hear you. Uh, Gary, you are muted. I don't know what happened. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I was muted and then I was talking and went away. Um, so let's uh, go to the next slide, please, and talk about the opportunity landscape. I used to call this the challenging landscape, and I've switched it to opportunity landscape because we really have to always look at the things in front of us to determine how we're going to respond. And I've always looked at health centers as a way to say, okay, 
we have a captive audience. We have a captive audience in the patients that we serve. We have a mission and a movement as to why we serve. So really kind of wrapping all this up together and, and making sure we put ourselves in a position to always stay ahead of what we see out there. And, and the top bullet there, we see the competition heating up with everything you read about CVS, Signify, Amazon, all sorts of other organizations are getting into this. Mark Cuban has filled over 1 million prescriptions uh, with his pharmacy. And I saw this uh, a few weeks back where Walmart announces growth of a new health centers, and they're going to add 20, at least 28 new health centers in four states for a total of at least 75 Walmart health centers offering primary health care by the end of next year. So think about that just for a minute. So we talk about there's plenty of patients to go around, but think about the competition for the staff, because we know there is a workforce crisis right now. Every, everybody's dealing with that, the shortages, and you see that in the third bullet. But, you know, there's a, thing, there's a lot of things that add up into the compilation of what makes this so challenging for us. And when you look at coming out of COVID, I don't, I don't think that I even uh, estimated it properly. I was thinking we were very prepared. I kind of knew what we were going into. But even coming out, underestimated the impact that this thing would have. And we're seeing it with the workforce, especially the younger workforce. So Gen Z is expecting more from the leaders and they want to focus on racial equity and cultural competence within the healthcare system. This is what they are looking for uh, on a larger, broader space. So this is, again, we're seeing a, a change in that. They're very, we've always wanted to see uh, equity and, and cultural competence, but I think we're seeing it and it's getting more traction because of our younger workers and they're bringing this passion into, into the workplace. In, inflation and labor shortage are continuing to strain health centers. They strain our health center. And it really is something that we deal with each and every day. Um, you know, the labor and cost to do business is exceeding reimbursement rates in some service lines. It it really is. You know, one of the things I was on a call this morning with with our own with my own CFO looking over our budget for the next year, and we're looking at you know there are certain areas where the, the cost of doing business is, is exceeding what we're getting paid for some of these things. It really is. It's you know these things have to be adjusted along the way, but that's the only way we're going to be able to keep up. Per a NAC survey that came out, I think back in February, the January, February, these were some startling numbers. 68% of health centers report losing up to 25% of their workforce, while 15% report losing up to 50% over a six month period and nurses are ranking the highest. And we're seeing a, a very similar track, uh, track record at our own health center. We struggle for the nurse population, uh, looking at a lot of creative ways to keep people. And, and even our turnover rates, have become higher than we are accustomed to. They're well below the national average, but they're still, uh, they're giving us challenges just like everyone else. And then of course, if you read Gallup and you talk about employee engagement, it's dropped to 32% with a six drop loss in highly satisfied workers. That's concerning because think about your highly satisfied worker category. Those are the folks that you think these are stable. We're gonna be able to depend on these people. These are the ones we give more work to. Although we probably shouldn't do that, we tend to. We're seeing a six point drop in those as well. And then data shows that women reported higher disengagement and dis dissatisfaction than men. And a step further, the younger workforce, those under 35, the Gen Zs and the millennials are showing a four point drop and a four point increase in higher disengagement. So again, we're seeing all of these things that are, that are really colliding all at once to make for that perfect storm. So you look at health centers and if you're gonna be a successful health center, really a successful organization at any level. The focus has to be on a brand that emphasizes culture and values and communicating more than just what they do, but why and how they do it. Next slide, please. So we'll talk about the uh, employer choice. And I mean, this is a, I haven't really gone into the employer choice uh, story in quite a while, but it is one that really, um, it, it creates, a, it, it renews my passion every time because it's something that once you're there, the work just starts. You can't, you have to stay there and you have to continue to do things that are bigger and better in order to maintain that level. But it comes down to culture and the impact of culture because genuine culture is not created by mission statements, slogans, or policies, but it's by the quality of the actual person to person interaction. So if you're walking into a health center, if you're walking into any place of business, you go to the grocery store, you go to a restaurant, if you see how those employees or staff are interacting with each other, that tells you a little bit about the culture. And so when we're doing, when I walk around our health centers or when I'm 
uh, where I bring visitors or guests in, or they're walking around and no one knows who they are. And they can tell me that they sense a genuine um, degree of content by and large uh, across our center. And that is a good feeling because you want that. And again, we all have, you know, all of us have problems. We have issues as well. And not everybody is as happy as I would like them to be. But I think by and large, our culture speaks to uh, the fact that it is one of engagement. And that is, again, it's the actual person-to-person -person interaction. We talk about the coaching culture, which we'll get to in a little bit. But this is part and parcel of what leads to that person-to-person that, uh, -person interaction. A culture of excellence is an environment where people understand on a very immediate and practical level what value, productivity, and true worth are all about. And the focus is really on quality of relationships within the organization. So yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about how we get there and what and, you know, kind of the steps for how do you improve and, and increase that quality of relationships. But that's really what the culture is about, is the quality of those relationships. And a genuine culture of excellence um, is present when you know your why and work to understand their why as well. Uh, four or five years ago, we had an executive retreat and we talked about the why. We were going through an expanded uh, version of our values, which I'll speak to in a second as well, but we intended to spend about 10 minutes on our why. It was more of a cursory exercise. Um, I didn't realize how critical and how impactful that conversation was, was going to be, but that 10 minute uh, two bullet in the slide turned into a four hour half day session. And coming out of that session, uh, this was a Friday. And on that Monday, my director of IT showed up in my office and he he looked like he'd been he he looked he was puzzled. He looked like he just had been up. He just had been thinking a lot. And and so I, I stopped what I was doing and pulled over and said, I pulled over up to the table and said, you know, asked what was going on. And his comment was he just couldn't find his why. Uh, and he was having a difficult time with that. And this was a very talented individual. And we just recently had him speak at one of my uh, local Virgi uh, Lynchburg, Virginia impact leadership events. And he told his story and his why. And we hadn't talked to each other in over three years. So I hadn't seen him. And I can tell you, um, at the end of our conversation that day, five years ago, I did ask him to take some time and, and help work through some of this to make sure he was positive of it. Uh, but within six months, he offered his resignation and he moved on into other things that helped him identify what his purpose was in life and what his purpose was as it relates to a career. And he's very, he's very successful now. He's always been successful, but he, what he did with us was he helped us really hone in on making sure we got to the heart of people's why. And when you get to the heart of people's why, that's coaching, that is engagement, and that shows people that you have an interest in them. And so when you start to do that, that is what breeds a positive, engaged culture. And the sad part is most organizations don't figure out the culture until things have gone wrong. And once that uh, train has gotten off the tracks of your culture, there is a lot of effort that has to take place to getting that back. And you can't build a culture over the course of a week or a month, and you can't speak it into action. So these, that's why I wanted to put the impact of culture in front of you so you would have this as we go into the rest of our presentation. Next slide, please. So the Johnson Health Center, talk a little bit about our journey. And I always like to start, she said it. Joyce Joya and Roger Herman wrote the official Employer of Choice book back in 2000. And all of the offshoots of best places to work, um, you know, great places to work, the things that you see that really are all over the place now, it really came off of that work that those two did. Uh, Joyce Joya is still doing this work. And we engaged her back at the end of 2014 to pursue the Employer of Choice path. And the reason we did it was because of the culture and because we wanted to see what the what our employees felt about our leadership. So uh, a lot of the other uh, surveys we had reviewed at the time really were, were all around, you know, how we how management was, uh, uh, you know, how management was perceived, how the supervisors. It wasn't as much on leadership, and I really wanted to lead people into a into a path versus pushing them. So this was one of the things we decided to target, and. We did it. We were successful with it. It took us a little over 20 months, but Joyce Joya in a newspaper article was quoted as saying it was the best culture that we ever looked at. They scored the highest on our survey in terms of some of the questions that we asked. And the Johnson Health Center probably has a better culture than most, and most 
if not all of them, have resource, have more resources than the Johnson Health Center, according to Joya. And this came out back in 2016. So um, next slide, please. And when I think about what, you know, I looked at all of those companies and all those health organizations that they had done the employer choice work for, and we, we felt very, very proud of uh, that achievement back then. And so it all started with a vision because you have to have a vision. And I always encourage people, if you don't have a, if, if you're not following a company vision, or if you don't have your personal vision, it's difficult to follow the organization vision. You should have a vision on what you would like to see done uh, in your own world personally. And then if you, you're working for an organization, what is the health center's vision? What is the vision for the next strategic planning period? There's all sorts of visions that play into getting from point A to point B. And in August of 2014, we were dealing with a lot of the same things we're dealing with now. It seems you know, kind of overarching, but recruitment and retention issues was really bad, uh, really bad back at the time uh, when I took over as the interim CEO. And we really had no employee engagement. It was uh, very limited. We had very little community engagement. We, do, we do, were just very siloed off. And you know, having grown up in this community, I'd moved and then come back. That was disheartening to me to see that. We had credibility issues. Um, there were, uh, I always, I joke and tell people that I used to walk into the grocery store and put my badge in my pocket because I didn't want to, I, I just, I wasn't, it wasn't at the time a place that I really felt my values were aligned with how we, the direction we were in and going. And that's not to say that, you know, I never, I never will never talk about how, um, you know, one, one uh, leadership philosophy is versus another, but there were differences. And, you know, there was, look across the just across the board there was a lack of trust and leadership and i was part of leadership uh, at the time i was the chief operations officer and and i felt uh, i felt a burden with that so you know really was on me with building those relationships up until the the 2014 when i had the opportunity to take over as the, as the interim and then really just made some statements right off of right out of the gate and uh, i remember standing up in front of our employee base back then and said our employees would be first we would have an engaged culture they would be number one and i remember someone in the very back of the room saying what about patients? And I didn't even have to answer that question because on the other side of the room, somebody responded and said, if we take care of the patient. If we are taken care of, the patients will be taken care of. And that was really the right response for that. And that was the starting of the build of an engaged culture. So we did that. We focused on, you know, wowing our customers and our, which were our patients. We rebranded ourselves in the community. And that was, we, we did a lot of foot soldier work and we would build trust and leadership at all levels. That was the plan. That's why it was going to take a while. And we made a very a bold statement right up front um, at that August session said we, we were going to become an employer of choice and we're just going to behave that way. And so this is that was the vision. And that's really where we wanted to take things. But you had to paint a picture of what the future looks like. And you do that when you do vision. Next slide, please. So how we did it uh, as the CEO of Johnson Health Center, my focus was on transforming the culture. So it started with me and we looked at our aspirations versus the crisis. So where do we want to go? Yes, we knew we had a crisis, but we only wanted to look over our, we only wanted to look at the crises. Uh oh, Gary's came off the music here. All right, now, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, hands are off the computer. I'm not touching the thing here. So um, hopefully you can hear me again. Uh, created, we created an 18 month plan that helped us stay focused and not change course when confronted with existing cultural challenges. And we were, I mean, you go through that. Anytime you go through any change, change is difficult because we're not wired for change. We're wired to learn how to change, but just to change in general, there were a lot of things that were taking place. So back to the first bullet, we did focus on our aspirations and looked uh, over our shoulders just as a point of reference. So we had to demonstrate a positive urgency. We had to inspire people to join us on this journey. And then we looked at our unfilled our unfulfilled potential, that should say unfulfilled potential, because we've had a lot of that uh, in our organization that nobody had tapped into. We took ownership in the culture we wanted. We modeled the way for leaders and the staff to see. And we, we put an intentional focus on developing leaders and looking at those high potentials that were going to help with this transformation. It wasn't just me. It wasn't just my executive team. It was a host of people that were going to help us make this happen. And then we created a team-oriented approach on the way to creating a culture of operational excellence and, and plus the staff and patient experience. So we invited a lot of people into those discussions and conversations. But the foundation of it all was our values, our core values. We have five core values, and we made our core values foundational to everything we did. 
They're embedded in all we do. We started it back in 2014, and everything we do is tied to those five core values. They're in they're on the they're the first slide of every presentation that you see coming from a Johnson Health Center uh, employee, and they are the first. Um, they're written in every job description, every performance review. Uh, this hiring decisions are made, um, decisions to move uh, folks along to a happier place are made, all using the, the Johnson Health Center core values. And then the one uh, mission is improving access to health care for all, because that's what we're here to do. Next slide, please. So a few results of that, just uh, so that everyone, um, you know, would know is really around um, what we've been able to accomplish since 2014. I just want to share this with you. We'll, we'll touch on it briefly, but we have We've really doubled our access to care since that time. We have mobile units, footprint expansions, and we did all of the expanded. Now we have had some, some grant dollars on the mobile units, but minus the mobile units, everything that we've done has been from organic growth. And we we stepped up into the community because the community, we weren't, we weren't meeting a need. And we have since that time established a degree of credibility to where we are the sought after partner for a host of things now, a host of initiatives to lead different things uh, at the community level. And we're much closer with our hospital system now. We're closer with other partners in the area. Um, our revenues have really kind of gone from, uh, you know, I know when I joined the health center, we were about a $6 million health center in 2011, but uh, we are projected close to 30 million for 2023. And that's, again, there's a lot of centers that are much bigger than us, but it's one of those things when you look at what we're able, what we've been able to accomplish over those times, it, it it really is, it's, it's just um, something that I'm very proud of and I, I'm proud of our folks that have made this happen. Our turnover does, um, our turnover does remain lower than a national average. I think last year I saw the national average was 39.6% for healthcare and ours is hovering around the 25% mark. That's as high as it's ever been. But at the same time, we were trying to work very hard to keep those numbers down. We are trending lower this year, but again, the work is so much harder now. And I wanna I want reiterate that for those who are on this call who are actually, who, who serve in a leadership position, the work is harder right now. It's a commitment that we that we really, uh, it's one of those commitments I say it's almost a 24-7 commitment. doesn't mean you work 24-7, but it means you commit to being that leader 24-7. We now formalize leadership and training programs all over the place. We have multiple teams and committees that, um, that drive these successes. As I said, we couldn't do this on our own. And our quality program has noted 80% improved outcomes since 2015, and we have that 97% patient satisfaction rate which was deemed a HRSA best practice back at our last site visit. And uh, it was one of those things we do these, this thing with this iPads and we were collecting over 30,000 surveys a year for uh, to determine how the patients felt about the services that they were getting. Next slide, please. So keys to employer choice success, we lived out the core values. And I'll emphasize the core values. And I'll talk about core values a lot because a lot of places, and again, the majority, um, they talk about having their values. And I'm not, you know, again, some may do it better than others. Um, but I think the real, the, the real um, litmus test on your core values is do your folks talk about them in the workplace? And can they reference them? Um, I get emails. I got one a week ago about somebody nominating someone for a core value award at the end of the year, which doesn't even come up until December. And we usually seek these nominations around the November timeframe. They're already coming in. So these folks talk about the values and that is really what we talk about living these values. It happens over time. That's where the transformation work comes in. We had an intense focus on inclusion and organizational culture and it started with helping them understand why and giving meaning to their work. So, in, you know, in the old days, I think we would, if we didn't, if we made a decision or someone made a decision, that was it. And there was no ex explanation that went deeper into helping to know why a decision was made. We worked very hard at that, very hard at communicating the why behind every decision so uh, we could bring people closer together. And we listened. And it started at the top. It starts with me. I have to be the one that does the listening first. And then we drive that down with a coaching mentality and a streamlined evaluation process. We shortened out annual review process and leaned into a formalized coaching process formal slash informal, because it is about the conversation with the people that work with you. We put the right people in place, and, and there were some that didn't, did, didn't necessarily want to come along for the, for the journey, and those folks left. And so um, and that's okay. That happens. When you go through a transformation, you can expect to move some folks along, or they'll move along on their own. It just, that's just the way it is. And it's okay, because it's not for everybody. Uh, we led with impact by building and nurturing these relationships and raising these leaders at all levels. 
we're passionate about what we're doing. I'm very passionate about this work. It is so, um, I'm reading here. Yes, so formalized uh, management training, it is, for, it is ongoing. Um, participation is required. We have Leadership Academy, which I will talk about in, uh, in a, one of the next slides, but we have two programs we participate in. There's one, we participate in a community program called Leadership Lynchburg, which we are so involved in that now. Started back in 2015, when we started nominating our, our leadership to go into these programs. It's a, it's a, it's a unique event that people from all over the community get. Um, you, you put in the application, you know, whether you, if you get accepted, you're in. Um, we had no one ever go through that, and for we've been we've had consistently one to two graduates each year from that. We actually put the first physician through that, who now serves on their board. So it is a, the leadership piece, and we did bring one in-house that we created coming out of COVID. We actually started it going into COVID, and we created a 19-course academy. April Lewis is on faculty for our leadership academy. And so um, we actually have a couple of po folks who are getting close to graduation for that being the first graduates. So 13 core courses, six elective courses. And really, it is about driving innovation and core values and a data-driven approach, because everything we do, if you can't provide some data to back that up and support it, then you're going to be you'll be challenging questions. So a lot of it was around our business intelligence arm. One of the things we did was we we split up IT. We we had IT focus on the systems and the, and the hardware and the software. And we had our um, we had our we created a business intelligence group to focus on the on the analytics, the data, and all of those types of things that could help us explain our story better. Uh, you know, if you're a provider, you want to know if the data that you're seeing is accurate. And that was one of the things that, I came from a for-profit world back in 2011, and we were so big on data. It was a large, uh, it was a it was bear corporation. So a large um, pharmaceutical and chemical company that we depended on data a ton. So we brought that into our health center world and, and really kind of focused on that to build trust at all levels. Next slide, please. So since COVID and what we do now, we still work on the core values that will never go away. We established the vision at the onset of COVID. So uh, at the very first call, we brought people together. We said we will not lose any employees. And that was before the funding came out. We said we're going to work to keep all of our employees here. And we were successful in doing that. Um, yes, we did. Uh, I see the question. Did we develop our leadership program? We did that ourselves. And um, the reason we did it is I, I do a lot of consulting as well. So I do a lot of work with the leadership development programs and do a lot of, just a lot of the teaching. So we looked at everything that made sense for our health center, tied it into our values and what people were asking for and seeking. And it's really, um, it's a, it's conference level coursework that's right inside our health center. It's not accredited, but it does offer people the ability to get educated that they would not get necessarily get um, because they can't afford to, you know, if they're front desk people and we open it to everybody. We initially did it just for leadership, but then we opened it to everybody coming out of COVID because people really express a desire to develop themselves. And it is amazing what you see when you see the, a mixture of staff and leaders in a room together. And we do breakouts with them. And so they are sharing each other's ideas. So those are all important things. Um, we, we increase visibility with these weekly town halls and they're still going on today. I started the COVID town hall virtually and I was amazed at the employees that would join this thing. And then we, it was so successful. We just, we just, now we do it every other week and we transitioned that into just a town hall. So we went from COVID updates to town halls. And we do get probably um, a half to a two thirds of our staff on every single call we have. And we share a lot of information. I do employee spotlights. I'll, if I don't have any updates for people, I'll interview one of our staff members that, you know, and a lot of them say, no, don't, please don't bring me on and talk to me. But others say, yeah, I'd love to do that. And it, it gives people exposure to, staff members they never knew so that has been a lot of fun there's the leadership academy i talked about uh, we reorganized to provide more operational uh, clinical support so we were we, we didn't have that you know that really um, operational clinical leaders in place uh, cl they were clinical but we made we created some positions that uh, helped us with some pediatric and family medicine leadership at that you know really at the at the ground level and we formalized mid-level leadership, created associate directors. I meet with them quarterly. I want to know what they're thinking. And I challenge them to, to do their own critical thinking. And uh, the takeaway from that was to get these 15 associate directors working closer together so they could solve a lot of problems. And that was the goal there is developing them because I look at them as our the next level up. So where do they want to go next? And whether it's with us or somebody else, I want them to come out uh, taking something away 
that is uh, that of value to them because if we're providing them value, we get value back. We, we centered our 2021-2024 strategic uh, strategy on practice transformation. So our strategic plan was about transforming our practice and bringing the joy back to, to the work that we do. That's everybody does. And that was our vision for the plan. That vision will carry on into the next strategic plan because we're not quite there. But our goal is to make um, make the uh, make the clinical world easier for our clinical team. So all of data that is entered, can we do it better? Is there um, is there highly advanced um, dictation software? And there is, and it's expensive, but we are going down the path of that right now. And the four providers that we're piloting with absolutely love it. So we're going to work to make sure that we can continue that process and then look at other ways to just uh, you know, to try to take some of the some of the really routine mundane work out of the day-to-day -day jobs. We're looking at any we, we're exploring uh, different scheduling methodologies and we're inviting their input in. We just had we just had a roundtable two weeks ago with our clinical leaders to talk about uh, what are their ideas to help with burnout. You know, give us some thoughts around that and we provide them tools so they can run their own groups. Um, and that's an area where we've worked, uh, we've had to work really hard is to invite them into a conversation that that empowers them to make decisions at their level. Sometimes I don't think they think that. And I think that's a challenge for us as leaders and as you as uh, coaches out there is, is coaching them to do critical thinking and giving them the tools to make those decisions because that's part of bringing the meaning to the work. I hold my executive team accountable for office hours at our larger sites and we do listening sessions and we do innovation roundtables. We do a series of innovation roundtables all year long. And um, so can I share core values? Yes, respect, teamwork, innovation, excellence, and integrity. So somebody just asked that and that's off the cuff. I don't have my badge on, but I should have listed those in there. And we do, I do expect my executives to be an extension of me and to get out there and make certain that our folks can see them. And, uh, and that's worked really well too, because you know, it's, I really want, people to know that we're not sitting in an ivory tower somewhere and we don't know what's happening in the field. Um, and that's just, again, that there's a lot of work that is involved with that. And it's, and it's out of comfort zone for some people, but it's part of finding your own comfort and being able to do that. And we do a heavy focus on staff well-being programs and addressing mental health concerns. Ne next slide, please. So what does a coaching culture look like? And we're gonna wind it down, but my good friend uh, and colleague, Tammy Green, who was a CEO in uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and now does her own consulting. And her and I do a lot of collaborating and back and forth, um, you know, trying to help each other. Iron sharpens iron, and April Lewis is the same way. But the, her definition is of a coaching culture is a culture of coaching which brings forth the wisdom and maximizes the contribution of all your all your people, all your team. Uh, oh, I see Tammy. Yes, yeah, she is amazing there. Um, she's our old CEO. Yes, so. She's great. I really like to uh, really like working with her. Uh, but coaching is about shifting leadership mindsets from control command or the expert knower to a space of invitation for greater buy-in. You've heard me talk about this the whole time. It's, it's about coaching is no more than just inviting people into a discussion, getting buy-in and driving engagement. And when you have this in place, your employees feel engaged with their leaders and they feel safe to ask questions and challenge the status quo or admit when they don't know an answer. I mean, this is big because you want them to be able to come to you if they don't know something. So it's all part of what a coaching culture is intended to drive. And at its best, it's the act of investing in your team members in ways that validate them and invite them to live up to their fullest potential for their own growth, as well as the synergistic contribution to a shared mission and vision. I tell people that if I, I still go to the orientation sometimes, but they do a video of me, I tell our new people, we harbor no illusion of keeping you here forever. But what we do expect and would like to have is 100% of you give us your 100%. We will give you the 100% because we want you when you when if you decide to leave, we want you to be a walking ambassador for us on the street. Be our next, uh, be our extension of our recruitment arm. We want to we want it to be a great experience both ways. So that's part of the coaching piece, and it goes from it goes across uh, the entire organization. Next slide, please. All right, making it happen. So. Um, Running out of time here, looking at everything. Um, okay, we got about five minutes, I think. So I, I, did, I wasn't good about leaving a lot of time at the end, but I'm trying to, uh, I'm going to move. I have the impact leadership model. It's on, it's on my impact leadership, uh, our impact lead website. And the top two is really what's important here. They're all important because you have to have trust at the very bottom to make all this stuff work. But the ability to influence, you have to have a compelling vision that delivers on the why and the purpose. 
not everybody has to be an eye on the disc scale. I mean, every you know, this is how you influence people or how you inspire people. Do it in your own way. So it's 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 really about driving influence, and you don't have to be in a leadership position to do that. But it's helping people get what they want, what they need, and help understand what their why and purpose is. The other one is make it personal, and this is about emotionally intelligent leaders. And one of the things that I want to make sure I didn't leave any of this out, but um, to be an emotionally intelligent leader is about building relationships and about understanding your own knowledge, your self-knowledge, your self-control, how, how empathetic are you, and then your social skills. And this, is, this can be taught. And then having the motivation to be able to improve yourself in all those categories. But that's really around what it takes to, you know, when you think about building these relationships, it is about how you position yourself as a leader to invite people into a conversation that helps deliver on a mission and a vision. And that is where the inspi inspiration to influence comes in as well. And the rest of these are all things that, you know, if you, it, it is a, a much broader explanation on the website, but these are all things that tie into being able to drive a coaching culture. This is the model I dropped into the Johnson Health Center back in 2014 when we started our employer choice track. Next slide, please. So influence and, and making it personal. Takeaways, build rapport with team members and don't rely on annual performance review. You'll increase their engagement because you build trust with them and ultimately you build some loyalty. It will help motivate your people as well. They will be far more receptive and even seek your feedback, especially when they may be struggling with something. And the other piece, it costs far less in bonuses that you may not have to give, especially if you don't have a direct authority. The ability to influence by getting buy-in through authentic engagement is priceless. Priceless. I mean, this is when you work across when you work across uh, departments. Like, think about IT. I depend on IT so much, but I engage with IT before I was ever in a leadership position. I always made sure that I built a relationship with our folks in IT because I always needed something, and they were always willing to, to help me along. And we just helped each other. We just we we were able to pick each other up at any given time and just and support one another. And you and you and your team will enjoy the work more. If you're not the top person in charge, remember, you're the mini CEO of your own world. So you control this. It's controlling the destiny in, in your own place. You can improve your own and the works group, uh, whether others come along or not. Just remember that because not everyone's bought into this type of uh, this type of culture. And, you know, things are shifting. So we, we got to we might have to be the, own, the people who drive a lot of this. But it, it is about what you do with what you have. Next slide, please. This is making it happen. Conduct your regular one-on-one -on -one meetings with each person on your team and initially find out a little more on what motivates them. Don't wait for the formal meetings to check in with them. I got a brand new uh, executive on my team and I want to make sure that that individual isn't struggling or having an issue. So I, I find time to, uh, whether it's at the, uh, whether it's at the coffee pot, whether it's, um, we were at an event and we were at the leadership event last week. And I just, I just asked how things going. Um, and, you know, sometimes people aren't, aren't willing to share that information with you because they 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 want to think they want you to know that they're doing okay, or want you to believe they're doing okay. But if they're not doing okay, you just got to ask them. So you just ask, how are you doing? Get to know them a little bit beyond just the role that they're in. Always ask good questions and be curious and be present when this is done. Because even when passing somebody, um, you know, you walk by somebody, hey, how are you doing today? And you walk on. Uh, I mean, that's okay. But I think it, have those opportunities where you're walking by somebody and ask them a question from a curiosity viewpoint. You don't have to get personal with them, but just it's, you got to show that you're interested in them. And write down the stuff that's important. So if they tell you something that you deem important about it, write it down because that way you'll, help, you'll remember for the next time. Foster an inclusive environment and leverage diversity from all angles. Diversity is everything. It's diversity of thought, people, personalities. Leverage it from all angles because you get a lot more input and a lot more smarter people in decision making comes from those types of environments. Remember, coaching is nothing more than intentionality and uh, purposely building relationships and helping others get what they need to be successful and understanding the meaning in the work that they do. Next slide, please. This is the go-giver mentality. The world is full of uncertainty. When people know they can always count on you to deliver the same quality of experience, no matter what, you become an oasis of stability within their personal sandstorm or change. When you can combine both excellence plus consistency, you truly create exceptional value. My good friend, Bob Berg, John David Mann, they wrote The Go-Giver. Uh, I've, I've become friends with Bob, the author there. And if any of you have read that book, that is a wonderful read. This is from Go-Giver Sell More. I would encourage you to take a look at that. We, we ran through that at our own health center. 
and um, just the principles and the laws of stratosphere success are moving. So I think that's it. Let's see what the next slide. Yeah, there you go. There's me. There's my contact information. If you have any questions, um, I know I got through this. I uh, didn't leave us any time. Sorry, Gerard. No, Gary, you did a great job uh, answering questions along the way. So very much appreciate that. Uh, let's see if, if we have any additional questions that uh, we might uh, share with you here. Uh, um, well, certainly we encourage you, if you have additional questions or comments, please uh, enter those in the chat. Uh, while we wait for those, Gary, we, first of all, thank you. You're we very appreciate well, thank you for having sharing. me here. This is great. You know I love this stuff. We appreciate you sharing the insights with us uh, and, and you know, your, your, your open and honesty, uh, uh, openness and honesty in terms of some of the challenges uh, that you face and learn along the way. Um, you, you mentioned that, you know, you, you um, let's see, that you felt like you were in a crisis uh, mm -hmm. when you all were originally starting this work. Uh, how can an organization use the uh, tips that you've shared or the, the, this culture work to be able to avert a crisis when it comes to their employees? Well, I think if you establish if you establish an environment of open communications, we have a culture committee too. We we launched our DEI program, you know, back before any of the, you know, back before it became trendy. I hate, to, I hate to say that, but back before the social unrest of 2020, when everything went uh, with in combination with COVID, we had already launched our DEI program because we wanted to really. We wanted to be so inclusive. We wanted to cast a broader net, making sure we weren't missing anything, and just wanted to create a place where everybody felt safe and welcome. I think that's what I would just suggest: is look at the things around your health center, and um, and look at things in your own world, and, and are you having real, true conversations with people? And are you, you know, and if you hear something is going on, don't just you know, don't just chalk it up and say, well, we've dealt with this before; it'll pass. No, really, you know, I would say that now more than ever, you have to lean in on some of these things and you have to give a little more ear to, you know, concerns of people because people are in a much different state now than they were three, four, five years ago. And, and I think that, and we're seeing a movement on that too. So it's expected that we lean in. And I think that can help you avert crisis. Once you're in a crisis, it's okay. The thing about a crisis is, just like the pandemic, we dealt with it. We knew it was in front of us. We didn't know how it was going to end, and it went a lot longer than any of us expected. But the fact is, we embraced it. And we said, "Okay, we have a challenge. Let's just make sure we use this challenge and build opportunities out of it." So that's the other piece: is you can't. You have to walk around with positive energy because if you walk around negative and people view you as negative or, or view you as um, not being able to do to really do anything other than maybe be the victim in the process, you're not going to have the kind of success to building the kind of culture that you would like, and it, it would take you a lot longer. So that would be my advice there. Thank you, Gary. Another question is, um, how do you gain executive buy-in on the necessity of focusing on the employees and putting these practices in place? That's a, that's, that's a question that's tough to answer because um, as I have learned in my consulting world, it, it's a mix of uh, opinions around that. And and I think the, you know ultimately what happens is it, this is this is just me. This is just me with Johnson Health Center and the executives that I have. You know, we work hard to 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 drive this type of culture because it's important to us. And our work is is easier when we have a culture of engagement and a, and we all we're all bought into it. Um, if you don't have that, you know, I would just talk about the importance of it. And if you can't get that executive buy-in and, and you're you're functioning in a department level, get it in your own department. So function you know, create that world and the world in which you sit and others can look and see into what's happening there. And then again, you become, you know, a, a, a st stabilizing force for that. A related question is how do you help managers make time for learning and developing themselves on a continuous basis? So we, we, we block the time we've committed to it. Um, it's funny. I had a dental hygienist and hygienists are hard to come by. So, and we have a lot of patients that are waiting to get into see be seen, but she it really wanted to focus on her leadership. She was, uh, she's somebody who we, we, we gave lead opportunities to, and that's again, part of our culture. Uh, and she kept taking the leader, these leadership Academy classes. And, and I, I just told, I just, I, I just told and committed to our dental team. I said, well, you know, and, and our CFO, I said, we committed to this as a broader vision. So we are not, if clearly, if we can't get, if it's an impact on patient access, okay, we'll, we'll give her another a shot another time. But we said yes to all of those courses for her. And it should, you have to just commit to doing it. Great. Well, we'll, uh, we'll take one more question here, Gary. Um, uh, 
what are the committees you currently have in place that are feeding your coaching culture? So we have a culture committee, which is huge. That's that's derived out of our DEI work. And we, we go every January, well, I should say every November, we, uh, we have 12 new people join that committee. When I first launched it, I had to beg people to get on that committee. I had to select them and get on the committee. Now we have people signing up and we have to say, you got to wait till next time. Uh, but we, we have that culture committee, which they go through all sorts of neat things for us. And they help us keep a finger on the pulse of what's happening. That's the, that is, is really one of the more impactful committees. They actually met this morning um, and talked about, you know, what makes you feel valued in the workplace. And so we have those open, safe conversations. We have our, our quality improvement committee. Uh, we call it continuous quality improvement, which we invite all sorts of participants into because we want them to understand why the value piece is so important. We just launched a, a value uh, uh, incentive program that's tied to value-based dollars. And now our clinicians really have interest in some of this stuff. So they're part of, they join these committees as well. We also have, a, we have innovation round table. We have, um, we have a patient safety committee. We're getting ready to launch a government relations committee. So it's really about giving people opportunities to develop you know, that where they may not be in leadership positions, but they have the ability to, to develop at certain uh, other places within our health center. And just, again, prepare them for work with us and work wherever they go. And I'm sure I got a bunch more that I can't think of right now. Well, we appreciate you sharing those with us, Gary. Thank you again so much for helping us to reflect upon uh, how to become uh, a, 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 um, a high trust uh, organization that uh, is really focused on their culture. Uh, and a culture of employee uh, well-being. Very much appreciate that, well, Gary. I, I, I'm honored to be here, and I really appreciate uh, inviting me into this and being part of such a great workshop and summit. It's it's humbling, and, I, and I'm thankful for it. And I appreciate all the people here with their questions and chats. I wish I could have got to every single one of them. Yes, and we ask you to keep those questions coming. Uh, again, we'll share those out uh, uh, so Gary can consider them in, in future engagements uh, that he has. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, right. Have a great rest of the day. You too, Gary. Thank you so much. Bye. So we're, we're going to switch gears now. We're going to move into our breakout discussions. We're going to encourage you to take, we're going to take about uh, uh, 20 minutes or so to have you reflect on what we've considered this morning already. Uh, we've had certainly great discussion uh, with April Lewis on uh, work well, on how to manage your, your time and your energy. We've heard from Gary about culture transformation within the organization. Oh, as you uh, as you move into your breakout groups, and we'll have you placed in those uh, momentarily. Uh, we want you to to do. We'll follow our approach that we had yesterday to introduce yourself to your peers, first name, last name, title, and organization, uh, and then um, uh, we'll ask you to name a recorder. Uh, we'll post a a Mentimeter in the chat that you can use for those recorders to plug in uh, the one or two key points from the discussion. We asked the recorder to record one or two key points from the discussion uh, that you'll place in the Mentimeter for all of us to be able to see. Uh, the questions that you'll consider in the breakout group are, you know, sort of what's top of mind uh, after the discussions that we've heard here today? What is the top of your mind. Uh, number two, uh, what are you already doing and what might be working or not working? What are you already doing? What might be working and not working? And then uh, lastly, what are you planning for the future? Uh, what might you incorporate based on the discussions that we've had today? Uh, so uh, top of mind, uh, um, already doing and for the future. Uh, those three key points in your discussions. Uh, so we're going to move you into your, your breakout groups here uh, momentarily. Uh, it looks like they're already up. Uh, you should have a member of the, the, the planning team or the advisory group that's uh, in, your, uh, in your breakout groups to help you if you run into roadblocks. So have a great discussion. We'll see you for, you can take a break at, um, oh gosh, um, Looks like 10 minutes after 3 Eastern time, 10 minutes after 12 Pacific time. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Looks like our panelists are here. Uh, we had an opportunity to, to hear from Gary uh, Campbell uh, about uh, uh, the coaching culture that they've established there at um, Johnson Health Center. Uh, now we get to hear from um, 
uh, some experts working in the in the field. So um, moderating this panel discussion is Stephanie Roden, uh, who we got to hear from yesterday, who's the Chief Operations Officer at Roanoke Schoen Community Health Center. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone. So excited about our coaching culture session this afternoon. It is with delight that I introduce to you Dr. Mary Blankson and also Jan King Robinson. Today, we would like to pick their brains about their coaching culture and motivation to coach um, at our health centers. And without further ado, I have a question. So each of you, would you tell us what motivated you to want to support a coaching culture within the health center sector? And welcome. Then why don't you start and then I can go next. <laughs> the power of the mind. That's great, that's great. Uh, my motivation to work with FQHC uh, comes from having worked in hospitals for many, many years, having worked in educational environments for many, many years, and knowing that that was the population of people that we were serving both in the hospitals and in education realm, poor rural disenfranchised areas, which is where my heart laid. And so that was the motivation. So while I was at uh, the hospital, I did have an opportunity to have a responsibility for our community health clinic. And then I learned about our fellow qualified health centers and just retired and colleague started calling me and say, hey, you've been around for a few years, <laughs> you got some advice and counsel. So I had been consulting uh, with other hospitals and thought, you know, this is really where my heart lies. So that's why I'm here. Thank you for that, Jan. Thank you. Awesome. And for me, um, you know, so in my background, I'm a family nurse practitioner. And from the moment I graduated as a family nurse practitioner, I took my first job at a federally qualified health center, the very same one that I still work at today, 17 years later. Um, but I started out as a primary care provider and working with my own team and really trying to figure out how do I take good care of this amazingly diverse, complex, you know, wonderful group of patients uh, you know, of all age groups, because I'm a family practitioner. Um, and then as I sort of grew within the context of my position at the health center, got involved in committees, um, you know, got a lot of wonderful coaching and mentoring myself, um, you know, wound up taking on smaller sort of uh, less formal leadership positions, and then ultimately ended up in this role of the chief nursing officer eight years ago, where I guide and lead close to about 180 staff across our network. And um, you know, a lot of my staff, uh, particularly my medical assistant staff, this is their first position as an entry into the healthcare workforce. So to have an opportunity to have support, to train and to grow um, is so very important. But from the moment I set foot in an FQHC, I knew I was never going to leave. So <laughs> here's to 17 more years. <laughs> All right. I, I second that. So we know the complexities of health centers is vast, and we understand that leadership across health centers are so, uh, it's so important um, for our um, mission and for our movement. Can you tell us with your vast backgrounds in leadership, how have you supported a coaching culture within health centers? Okay. Sure, I, I can start with this. I think, um, you know, for myself, uh, gosh, it's been a really, really long journey because I think in order to really have effective coaching, there's a lot of different elements and pieces to the puzzle that you need to have all along the way. And um, it started very small and very simply uh, in my first year as a chief nursing officer, really trying to figure out how do I uh, create the documentation, the training and support that we need to really define all of our support staff roles and other roles along the way. Um, as one of the, I think, core components of having a really good coaching culture is making sure that roles um, and expectations and sort of standards um, are, are really spelled out so that everybody kind of knows this is what's expected of me, this is what's expected of my team member, and this is how we support each other. This is where my role begins, this is uh, where it ends, and where I need to really leverage your specific gifts and talents for success. 
Um, and, and really it's sort of through that knowledge and through that education that we can then sort of identify um, folks with specific talents, uh, champions along the way to really engage them similarly as to how I was engaged uh, growing up here at the health center as an informal leader, uh, being able to develop my skills and hone my, hone my skills before I took on anything formal. Um, but really, I think it's through those relationships and through that support that we have this transparent culture where we can talk about measurement and we can give feedback um, because it's all for the purpose of us taking good care of patients, taking good care of each other, um, and really being successful at the end of the day. Um, so a lot of it has to do with your communication style and your verbal culture. Um, you know, what are the words or how do you describe things? Um, one of the best examples that I always share is uh, particularly with medical assistants, uh, because this is a group I've been working a lot with at my health center and at other health centers across the country, is how do we make sure that medical assistants know um, that when we are delegating work to them, it's not because we just are trying to make the lives of the providers so much easier and we're just seeing them as a downstream catch-all, but really because we're valuing their unique talents, their unique training, their ability to be masters of the health record in terms of knowing what to click and when to click it and what it means when you click it. Um, you know, whereas sometimes as providers, you know, we're much better at free texting and sort of telling the story and, um, and giving that full background. So it's really out of this culture of value instead of a culture of we're just trying to make one staff member's life easier or better or to retain one type of staff member. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's sort of the general that I'd like to share um, at this point. Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a, a real mixed background in terms of academic and hands-on. And so I'm going to be academic for a second because this is the place I start. When I think about culture, and culture for me, that when I heard that phrase, I put it in the context of human resources, organizational development, talent management, um, and leadership development. And through my 40 plus years of work, I have been um, very, very fortunate to have people coach me even before I got into the work world. You know, my father, my mother, my brothers. And one of the things my father would often say is, you must be coachable. And I grew up hearing that. What does coachable mean? He said, and my mother's response to that was, don't wear your feelings on your sleeve. You know, you've got to be able to get feedback and take what you can use and leave what you can't use. Even if what you're leaving may be most valuable to you, you'll figure that out at some point if you're coachable. And so those kinds of enduring lessons stuck with me and along my career, always in, in operations and management. Um, I went to law school, got out and decided I would work in employment law and only spent a year there because I felt like, mm, I wanna be on the other side of this because I see the folks that are coming in with the issues, they're too late. Where do you really start having the conversation about culture throughout? So when you're asking and you know in your company how many light bulbs are changed within a year, because that's important to know what everybody at every level is doing and that we can acknowledge all the way up to, you know, that kid that's changing those light bulbs. He's really a go-getter. What are we going to do to cultivate him and engage him? Because I've always lived in small communities. There's not a lot of choices and places where you can go. How do we identify this kind of talent? And who else is looking? Because all these nice comments are being made about folks. Well, how do we redirect that into skills and strategies that we're really going to adopt here that we can share throughout? So it's just not one or two people looking for talent and how to keep talent. Because we know in small rural areas, keeping talent is, uh, is a major challenge. <laughs> And as long as folks are excited and growing, it's not always just compensation. It's the level of engagement. Are they working with other people who are inspired and doing great work? Long way around. I hope that answered your question. Absolutely, <laughs> Jan. I will say, Jan, it's not just rural areas that are struggling with staffing. I it know is that's true. Literally everywhere. Well, everywhere. Especially with nurses. You're right. You're right. And so with that struggle everywhere, how do you then reach the individual? who is of great value, but not so coachable? <laughs> That's a yeah, good question. I, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of strategies to do this. And, and I think, um, 
you know, of course, uh, the, one of the most challenging strategies, though, which I think is actually one of the most successful and, and um, is really just making sure that you have a very open door policy. Um, we have listening sessions at our organization where we are always kind of meeting. We have these be paid sessions. They're after hours so that that way nobody's distracted with clinical work or with other things. But where we really try to listen and see what are the challenges that people are facing? What are the things that they feel like they need more of, less of? What isn't, you know, working well? What's going bump in the night? And with that, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, just as Jan was discussing, sort of leaders may emerge or uh, people that might end up being spokespersons, you know, for, for the group of staff that you're supporting. Um, and really, you'll get to understand that kind of every section of your workforce really needs different things. Um, you know, back at CHC, one of the things that we have worked on over the course of the last probably nine months of my life has been, uh, we had new legislation that finally passed to allow medical assistance here in Connecticut to give vaccines. But as you can imagine, since this has never been allowed, um, we have had to go through this huge transformation of our workforce to get a bunch of medical assistants who aren't certified, certified, and then have them do additional training and support, you know, all throughout the way just to take on this new um, clinical opportunity to be a vaccinator, which at first, you know, was very, very challenging. People were like, well, I don't want to do any more work. You know, why do I want to do more work? Um, how are you going to compensate me more? What are you going to do? Um, and really, as we listened more and had more individual conversations, what we found is that, you know, people were really scared about becoming certified. They were nervous about taking the exam. They were worried about what it would mean for their job if they failed. Um, they were worried about actually having to vaccinate somebody or vaccinate a child. You know, maybe they felt okay vaccinating an adult, but it was really scary to think about vaccinating a child. Um, but as we listened more, we really found um, that we could split our workforce up into about six or seven different groups where the needs were very different. And I could meet with them sort of one-on-one -on -one, um, to you know, hold their hand when they needed hand-holding, uh, give them support, like paying for the exam and reassuring them that if they had to take the exam a second time, that we would still pay for the second time, um, you know, and that their job wouldn't be in jeopardy and just giving them that level of reassurance. Um, not only did I think it you know, it go a long way to let them know that, you know, you you can have an audience with a clinical chief. You know, I'm not so far up in the stratosphere, but our organization really is flat enough that we can have a conversation, a meaningful one that I recognize you and your function and your role, and that I can show you a future that I see for you that you may not see for yourself. Wow. Um, and kind of, you know, being able to support them to dream big dreams is, you know, exactly what we hope for even when it's scary. <laughs> yeah, I think I, one of the things too, uh, Mary and Stephanie, is that we have to train our supervisors or managers in the language of coaching, in the language of talent, of identifying talent, and there being opportunity to say, boy, we really have a hard charger here. This person, where do you see the customer service that they have provided this patient or how they were just right on the money with this physician? Um, and is there a formal way of recognizing that talent? Is there within the organization a high potential program at all levels as a way of, particularly I speak from a, a small communities, but as you said, it's happening all over. There are lots of choices and it's not just money that, that we said before is keeping folks. You know, it is, do I have people that care about me or looking at me, giving me opportunity? And how do you build that? So unless at the highest levels, you're not valuing that, then you don't have it as a construct. You don't have it as something that's being discussed across the executive tables or management tables. So I think it has, I, for me, the most valuable way of working with folks who have the potential to be coached, may not recognize it or wanna be coached is already having a system in place to be able to develop those skills. And some of your, your senior, not even your seniors, but your leaders, and those leaders can be at any level, that already show some aspect of those skills. And then engaging them and teaching them, you know, how to, what is this thing called coaching? You know, it's not what I think you should do. What is it that you have an interest in doing? And what is my assessment tool to see? Does that match what my needs are here? Or do I have a roadmap that I can invite you to look at it and we work out together as a way of, helping to develop your skills and put you someplace where you have some excitement about. Does, I, does that get close to what you were asking? Stephanie? Absolutely. 
Mary and Jan, I've had the benefit of being coached, but I have to be very transparent in saying that it was very difficult for me to receive the invitation um, <laughs> as I grew in leadership to be coached. What advice would you give to our organizations who need to consider coaching as a method of growing on how to help um, their peers and leaders that they have identified as great leaders with full potential in receiving um, the invitation of coaching? I'm going to jump in on that one because I've had that responsibility of creating those programs for different organizations and different sizes, a system as well as an independently um, owned hospital. You got to have a program. So that when we talk about coaching, it's not looked upon as, gee, you know, this is a performance improvement plan. No, this is how to develop you because we want to keep and retain you. Um, and so that coaching does not become something that you, you feel like, oh, gee, why was I picked out? That it's something that is known throughout the organization that this is a great opportunity. And even if there's a formal program, you may find somebody within the organization that you are responsive to, that you feel is really giving you some feedback that you haven't gotten otherwise, or you can hear from where you couldn't hear from somebody else because of whatever the dynamics are. So that there's opportunity for coaching to be a culture and not just come through a specified program. So I think that it's new enough that some of us have been coached and think, well, gee, why am I, why am I being brought in here? What am I not doing? As opposed to, gee, they picked me out because they see potential here. And they want to fan this potential and they're going to give me some skill sets and introduce me some things that I haven't otherwise been exposed to. Um, I actually had the great privilege um, during my doctoral program and then actually brought an expert into our community health center specifically for my nurse managers, where we did um, some programming around personality testing and there's also a leadership inventory that we did. Um, and it actually was a really, really wonderful opportunity for us to talk about sort of strengths and opportunities, which I think oftentimes when you do, when you use those types of tools and then have structured facilitated conversation around it, it really does, uh, you know, kind of bring you to this opportunity where you can talk about how every single person needs coaching, right? We all have strengths, we all have weaknesses. Um, I oftentimes, I think this is where one of my strengths as a leader in terms of being able to be vulnerable with my staff is really beneficial because I try very hard in my verbal culture with, with my department in particular, but also with other providers and other staff to talk about the ways in which I've received coaching as an executive leader um, to really try to show them that we believe in coaching at the very highest level and every other, uh, you know, aspect. There have been times when I've said, you know, I can feel very passionate about something, which you know, when I'm speaking at a conference is a huge value, right? Other people hear the words that I'm saying, they feel really drawn to the messages. But if I'm in a meeting, uh, you know, where I feel very passionately about something, it might sound like I'm upset or angry with another department or with another person. And that can be, you know, really deeply personal, um, you know, for the other person receiving that passionate message. And so, you know, being able to give these examples that we are not perfect people, but we are people who are committed to working to always um, perfect what we're doing and, and to always think of feedback as a gift, um, I think really gives permission to everybody to see, hmm, I wonder, I wonder what I should be working on or what my growth opportunity is, um, because they, they see that growth in their leaders as something that has made them to stand apart, you know, has really, uh, helped them to achieve higher things and higher levels. So then they say, well, I, well, I want to do that because I want to achieve those things. And I want to, um, do more and be recognized. And, um, you know, that I think is very, very valuable to them. It does take effort though. And as somebody pointed out in the chat, you know, it's true. Not every executive leader is good at kind of being that vulnerable to be able to share, you know, their strengths and their weaknesses. If your staff points something out to you, I, I had a nurse point out to me the other day, um, gee, you know, I feel so much better now that you've told me what's happening. I really wish we had had this conversation like a month ago. And I said, you know what, that's really great feedback for me. I should have communicated better. I'm sorry for that. Um, and I think anytime we take responsibility for those, you know, little ways that, you know, not necessarily seeing it as, as a failing, but as an oversight, right? We have a lot on our plates. 
Um, but the more we take responsibility for those things, the more our, our folks feel heard, they feel valued, and they feel like, wow, that didn't hurt so much for them. Like maybe when I get feedback, it won't hurt so much for me either, because this is a, a, a culture of um, support and uh, maybe a little safer than your average culture. I just, I have to add one thing. One of the, the uh, generative aspects of coaching culture has been this term thought partner. So a lot of CEOs have thought partners as opposed to coaches, but it's the same thing. It's, you know, who can I run ideas across, get some feedback that I'm not coming up with myself. And I think one of the most powerful things that we as leaders and actually as individuals can do is telling ourselves the best stories are the ones where we have fallen on our own face where we have messed up, where we have dropped the ball, where somebody who's gracious enough to pull us off our own sword and tell the story. There is life after these failures. You know, This is what I've done with them. This is why I'm better for it. And so I think when you get so far removed from that, that we do a disservice and we don't build the culture. So I, I call it telling on myself culture. So I mean, that's part of giving room that, hey, gee, we, we're all human here. We're all still learning. Wow, we really benefited from your rich answers. And let's take this a step further as we try to understand how to adopt a coaching culture. Coaching culture takes dedication and commitment from the organization. And we know time is very limited and something that health centers really have a hard time with these days. What advice would you have for health center leaders hoping to adopt a coaching culture and engage coaching and building strong leaders um, across their organization? I think the best advice that I have is I think as much as you can build it into your regular workday. First, if you if you build the verbal culture in everything that you do, you will foster a coaching culture just by the way that you speak, the way that you take responsibility, the way that you share about your own opportunities for growth, um, and uh, also in the policies, procedures, trainings, other things. Um, we implemented a new ladder program for our medical assistants. Anytime you create opportunities for people to advance and to grow, it engages them in the conversation and engages them in this thought of, I should be thinking about what the next steps are. Um, I think the other thing that we did too, which I thought was really unique, um, is we did some cross department coaching. So we actually had all of the leaders were assigned up to five individuals who wanted to have uh, just a 20, you know, I think it was a 15 or 20 minute conversation. So we had five of these booked in our day and they were people who weren't from our own department. So maybe I met with somebody from IT or you know, somebody from HR or maybe somebody from our Weizmann Institute, somebody who wasn't a medical assistant or a nurse. Uh, and we had an opportunity to just listen to them, their hopes and dreams for the future. Maybe some of them were to you know, build their own business outside of the organization. Maybe it was to grow within the organization, but to really think about the culture of our of our um, health center as a family, as a community that wishes good things for each other, not only within the health center, but outside of the health center, I think was really beneficial. Um, and then we were able to share, um, you know, ask for permission if there was something that we could do within the health center to, to help or connect that person. Sometimes we found that there were uh, sort of unofficial mentoring that could happen. Like I actually met some people who worked in our call center or worked at the front desk who wanted to be medical assistants and they were connected with me and I got to talk with them about, you know, what would it take and how could they do it? What are the health center benefits that could help them to get there um, and things like that. So there really are a lot of those opportunities and even just a 10 to 15 minute touch point can really make all the difference. Um, if you have a meeting that ends early and you get 15 minutes back, maybe spend five minutes of that reaching out to a staff member you haven't spoken to in a while and just say, how are you doing? Anything I can do for you or, you know, like how, how are things um, sometimes can be can be really meaningful. Uh, I would add to that that and I'd love all, everything that Mary said. So you've got to have a very strong human resources or talent management or somebody who's going to be driving this so that your leaders have it as part of their performance evaluation. What is the retention? What kind of equity studies have you done? What, what does, do you, does your staff look like the people who you're caring for? Where are the measurements in this? This is what gives us the power 
with the punch of doing this kind of cultivation of individuals. Unless we're tracking it, unless somebody is reporting on it, then it really is kind of left up to the goodwill of those who are thinking that way as opposed to goodwill and it's my job. This is my job. And this is really directly related to the quality of care that we are able to provide for the communities that we serve. How are we serving our highest value entity? And that is our employees. What kind of consistent training? We have to get our medical training and keep up our certification. But what about checking in with, are they being challenged? Are they pleased with where they are? Are they getting the support that they need? Are they on the right seat on the bus? All of those kinds of things we've been trained in talent management and human resources to ask and to do. And that's how we support our leadership. And we're training our leadership so that you all are thinking and then at times appropriately challenge human resources. But all of this has to be, I'm a, I'm a numbers person from day one. If it ain't measured, it's not important. It's not gonna be discussed. I want the metrics. What does it look like? You know, what's happening? Our employee satisfaction surveys, um, our customer service satisfaction surveys, all of these surveys give us this kind of intel where we have opportunity and where we might be hitting it out the, block, out the park and we get to celebrate. Transparency, very, very important. So important. You know, our workforce serves as the heartbeat of our health centers and everything that we do and caring through coaching and developing a coaching culture goes a long way. I'd like to open the floor at this point for questions for our panelists. I did see in the chat, somebody had mentioned, um, you know, that they don't do performance evaluations at their health center. Um, and I just, I would really, really encourage you to consider the possibility of implementing one. I know that it uh, can be a bit of a lift and remember you don't have to, you know, reach nirvana in one year. But I do think, you know, particularly when you look at the HRSA compliance manual um, in looking at how you track even credentialing and privileging of staff, particularly your clinical staff and things like that, you really have to be able to prove competency. Um, and so unless you're actually evaluating the competency, I mean, yes, you do wave testing competencies. Typically, if you're um, AAA HC or Joint Commission, uh, you know, recognized or accredited, but um, but I do think that, you know, you're sort of maybe skirting the edge of the compliance manual if you don't have some kind of an evaluation process. And that could look very simply at first. It could just be maybe um, you as an organization define a few specific values that you want every member of your organization to be benchmarked against. Maybe it isn't, uh, you know, maybe it is a little squishy at first and not something that is sort of hard and fast and measurable. Um, but then as you move and refine your performance appraisal, you can add uh, clinical data metrics or other types of performance metrics that really do kind of meet the definition of a SMART goal where it's measurable. It is something that um, we can really affect change on and can actually even encourage your staff to do that sort of rapid cycle performance improvement as you go. Um, so I know for us, for example, 60% um, of our performance appraisal is all based on goals. And the majority of the goals are for our clinical team members are clinical measures. So for example, um, the depression screening measure, uh, providers don't get measured on that. Medical assistants do because they're the ones who are collecting the data. They're the ones that are triggered to know this patient is due for their depression screening. So the PHQ-2 to PHQ-9 has to be completed. Um, you know, depending upon the scores might need the PHQ-9 as well. And you know, over a six month period, if you had 300 opportunities, what, you know, what percentage of those did you successfully complete the PHQ-9? The beauty of this is, is that in an organization, you, are, you would create what we call a measurement culture where measuring isn't scary, right? It isn't about making you look bad. It isn't about um, you know, making you feel bad. It's to say, what are our best opportunities to look for improvement? And as we look across our, our organization, for us, we're a multi-site organization. So I, if I were a medical assistant, I would be able to see this is how I scored in depression screening. And this is how I score in comparison to all of the other MAs at my site, because I'll have a site average. And then this is how I score in comparison to the agency average, because maybe my whole site is struggling with this, or maybe it really is just me, or maybe I have a best practice and I'm someone who should be highlighted as a leader and should do some booster training for people who are struggling. 
So there's a lot of things that data can do for you. And again, if the narrative and the leadership support that goes along with the data is really about reward and value and quality improvement, it doesn't feel you know, punitive and you know, nitpicky, but it really feels like we are together on the same team, really trying to all row in the same direction, which is the direction of high quality care. Yeah, th I agree, Mary. I think one of the greatest barriers to being an excellent organization is a lack of metrics. Uh, not to have a performance evaluation, I think it's a disservice, not just to the individual who's being evaluated, but to the customers that you're serving, the patients that you're serving. Um, unless we're all, we have very clear job descriptions, what we're doing, what our responsibility is, and, and many, most things can be measured, but you know, we also have looking at uh, customer satisfaction, but unless we know what our job is, what my responsibility is, and at what level I can do that job, and different people can do it at different levels, that gives, by comparison, perhaps me an opportunity to do another job that I'm better suited for, but you have data. You also, this has been a struggle, and I, I expect to get a lot of inf uh, responses from this, but when I got into the medical field from education, uh, it fell very hard on my ears when fellow employees would talk about one another as we're family, we're family. I was brought in as the chief human resources officer and I was counseling people who were having difficulty and issues. And, and I thought to myself, you know, family is hurting us because we can have warm, good feelings about people we've been in community with, our kids are in school together. But unless I see you as a team member, I'm not able to then say, gee, my family member over here, Uncle Steve, is really doing a terrible job, but he's Uncle Steve. We're going to find a place for him in this organization. But if Uncle Steve has been given a performance evaluation and I've done everything I can to help Uncle Steve succeed, when Uncle Steve comes to my office, he already knows it ain't working, Jam. I, I know we've tried to do everything we can. Uncle Steve is not, if he doesn't take himself out, he's gonna thank me for putting him out of his misery. So the language is part of the culture we're creating. So it's the opportunity as we're looking at this word coaching culture and what is the culture of our respective hospital or FQHC or community health center. Think about the power of that word family. I feel great affection for you. I might even like you more than I like some of my cousins and my aunts and uncles. But first, we're a team, and this is the job. The job is to do our very best for these folks who are coming here, depending upon our care. So that's a little controversial, but I thought I'd just add that out there. We've got to look at our language. Hey, I think you, you have some truth serum there. It's very hard, you know, to separate team from family. And then those emotions get attached in that process as well. I'd like to look at coaching from a group standpoint. How have you used um, group coaching? And do you think it works for those who may see individual coaching as something that they can't do, um, has have been able to benefit and have individuals benefited from group coaching? Um. I developed a program for a uh, health system, which was a high potential leadership program. So these were individuals who were selected by some of their leaders um, as, as being folks that they could see maybe su even succeeding them someday, being the leaders of the healthcare organization. And so it was a system. So there's several hospitals within the system. And so those individuals were identified, they went through a, a very rigorous assessment process where they were assessing one another, they were being assessed. And then the leadership decided upon who should be this formative group. And so those folks came together and we had oh, a list of items that we thought might be of interest to them, but we also wanted to know what was it they were interested in learning and what things worked in terms of being a group learning experience. And by having them come together, first they've been recognized as high potential. So there's a gift in that. Then they have an opportunity wherever they're gonna be working within the system to know that they're going through a process, it's a year long process, but when they leave it, they have made these relationships. They're gonna be able to call upon one another. And so the coaching became not only the experts who came in to talk on different topics, 
but to hear what the different perspectives among were along, among their colleagues, their equals, the people who are at the same level. And those were for me, the, the beginnings of what they were experiencing as thought partners. Thought partner does not have to be somebody who's had 40 years of experience and been president of you know, three different or FQHCs. They can be the person who's sitting next, with, next to you who thinks differently and can give you an opportunity to say, wow, you know, I, I might approach it this way. And it just gives you that benefit. So I think having groups is very helpful because you're forging relationships among those people that you hope will also continue to excel. Mary, what you got? <laughs> I was just responding to something in the chat too, um, just talking about sort of the performance appraisal and the subjective versus objective and um, just, uh, you know, wanting to put some feedback in there that I, I know that of course, you know, uh, everybody will cringe, you know, at subjective feedback, but again, sometimes you have to start somewhere um, and subjective is something that is really simple to implement. So particularly if you are starting somewhere, you're halfway through the season, um, you could actually roll out a new performance appraisal with three or four subjective evaluation pieces. Um, and again, if you're not ready from a budgetary standpoint to tie it to anything merit, again, just even getting some amount of feedback and beginning that sort of communication feedback loop, um, having a place to start is important. And then you can always build on additional clinical metrics from there. Um, typically what my cycle looks like is um, around this time of year, so May, uh, so like April, May, June, we develop our metrics for the year and then I train them in June. So my team knows I'm gonna measure their performance from July one to the end of the year. We, our performance appraisal cycle ends December 31st. We begin to uh, create our performance appraisals in January. So like by the end of February, all of our appraisals are entered and our merit process is completed in May with our merit increases being retroactive to January 1 is typically how we work. And then the cycle starts all over. It's April. I look at, you know, what were last year's measures? Are there any new measures that we care about? Anything new that, you know, maybe maybe we couldn't get data on last year that we thought we could get data on? Um, you know, so we might adjust a few measures like this year, for example, we've seen a huge reduction in our lead screening rate. So I added lead screening to our medical assistant scorecard, for example. Um, nursing scorecards can be a little bit challenging. Um, we, you know, have measures around self-management goal setting and hypertension control and diabetes control, which of course, some of those measures are on the provider clinical scorecard as well. Um, but we want to give uh, sort of that encouragement to our nurses that they can be proactive and identify nursing work um, that needs to be done with our patients and just go ahead and do it. Um, from a population-based standpoint. So I think um, for, for us, that's sort of how our cycle is built. So if you're looking for a way to think about implementing your performance appraisal process or trying to find a way to make it a little bit more manageable, I think having a cycle and having, you know, where everybody knows what's expected and when will really help you as a leader and will help your staff to know what to expect as well. Sounds like one of the participants participants may want to make a comment about appraisals as well. Please hi, go ahead, sure. Ms. McLean. Yeah. Yes, hi. I I just um, I'm a consultant, and uh, one of the things that I do is match the job description to the evaluation. The job description becomes the evaluation, and you may have heard of competency based job descriptions. That's what we're using. And that takes a lot of the surprise out of things. They have a copy of their job description. They know they're going to be uh, evaluated on exactly every single item that's on there. Now, they are long. Uh, I will say that they have about 70 on an average um, items that they're responsible for. But I find that that, and, and I couldn't agree with you more, Mary, that um, meeting with the employee in between uh, the actual annual evaluation is key to making sure but uh, that things are going right and there are no surprises. But I, I highly recommend the use of competency. Employees find it very simple to use and I've known employees who look at it monthly 
and uh, come up and say, how am I doing over here? You said I wasn't so, you know, quite meeting that last year. So um, that's something to consider. Yeah, uh, those yeah. are great comments. I, I would <laughs> recommend at least quarterly. And that is why there are no surprises because one of the things that an employee, and this is a coaching tip, needs to feel is that their success is your success. You're doing everything you can to make sure that they succeed. So that after meeting four times over the course of the year, um, if you have together worked on what can we do to make sure that you can be successful in this job, what other skills do you need? What, what do we need to do? Are you in the right bus, but in the right seat on the bus? Um, it may not take the whole year. It may not take four sure. evaluations for the person to say, this is not working. Um, it doesn't have to take that long with that kind of clarity. So I do think that meeting with people regularly, and I, I know that my managers used to meet with their folks on a monthly basis, because mm -hmm. that's how they would drive that ship. And so there are no surprises because things happen where employees, something happens either personally or something happens within the organization where they need some support, time off or some different uh, folks to come in, different resources, compensation, money, whatever. And there's got to be that openness to even if this isn't time for your evaluation, if you need something to be successful, you've got to be line, straight line to me as mm -hmm. manager. Yeah. yeah, I think um, just to give you guys an example, I know I saw in the chat, um, I did do a poster for NAC on our medical assistant scorecards, and I can share kind of examples from last year's appraisals, both for our nurses and for our medical assistants. Um, I'll make sure I get them to um, Megan after this, and she can send them out to everyone. Um, but I think, um, you know, it really took a lot of thought for us. So just as Jen was saying, you know, our medical assistants, you know, everything in our electronic health record is really tied to the PCP on record, which isn't going to work, particularly if, you know, unless that medical assistant is really, really supporting that provider 100% of the time, which I think we all know that happens on a pretty, you know, we try as much as we can. Um, but, you know, so what we did is we actually changed how we document uh, in our electronic health record. So in the field of the person who takes the vital signs for that record, they actually enter their employee ID. So it is a discrete number. Uh, so I can actually identify any chart that a medical assistant roomed based on their employee ID number being in the record. Um, so we actually run all of our data by that. So even if you worked half of the year with one provider and the other half of the year with another provider, we can really isolate your data. Um, and I think in the FQHC world, I definitely think of course that you know, I'm, I'm definitely, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not in any way against company competency-based learning and appraisals. Like we do a lot of competency-based stuff. Um, but I also think from clinical data metrics, um, we base a lot of our stuff on the uniform data system and a few of our other value-based contracts that are very, very important to us. And, you know, these are highly benchmarked, you know, clinical metrics that clearly matter to the federal government and matter to other, you know, grantors in our state and things like that. Um, so if there are portions of that workflow that you can tie to your medical assistants or tie to your nurses or tie to other staff members, um, you should be able to measure those things along the way. Um, and as Jan had pointed out, kind of meeting with people is important, but I think even more important is getting the data into their hands. So we are in the process of refining for this year, based on a few of our new added metrics, a dashboard where our medical assistants um, and staff can go to any time and they can run, like, how am I doing on depression screening? How am I doing on this? They can look at the last week, they can look at the last month, they can look at the last two months, because what that does is it motivates them to be able to say, you know what, I can do some self rapid cycle performance improvement here to figure out like, why is my data not counting? Like, what is happening? Like, am I not clicking the right box? Am I just forgetting to ask these questions? Like, what's the problem? Um, and it really encourages them Like, we create a, a, also a communication plan where they can reach out to me, they can reach out to our data teams to say, listen, I did this work. It's not showing up on the dashboard. Like, you know, can you help me? And we will look into it and we'll figure out exactly, you know, why didn't it show up in the data? Is it because maybe the note wasn't locked in time um, by the provider, or maybe the medical assistant does need some additional training on where to click. Um, and, and I think the beautiful part of it is, is that at the end of the day, we have proven that we all want the same thing. We all want the highest quality care, but sometimes with all the different clicks that we do in a day and the 47 measures that we're looking at, it can get very confusing and it's easy to make a mistake, right? So this helps us to identify those mistakes, identify those training needs so that we can best be the, the leaders that we need to be for the staff that we're leading. 
Thank you so much for that and this rich conversation. We appreciate you taking the time today to participate on our panel. And we know that it's because of you, we have all gained more information around the value of creating a coaching culture. As we end, can you give us just one more seed of advice that can help us understand what we can do to adopt a, a coaching culture? For me, my experience has been that any kind of culture development or cultural change must start with the executive team and actually beyond. The board needs to be involved and they need to be trained because those are the folks who are gonna be holding everybody else accountable. So if you want a, any kind of culture that you want to bring, whether it's a wellness culture, a high performance culture, or a coaching culture, which is all part of a high performing entity, you've got to have leadership from the top who's tracking it, who is passionate about it, who has the staff who are also excited about it at every level so that it doesn't matter the level that comes to the executive to say, hey, you know, we had an opportunity where I think we dropped the ball here on being able to explain what went wrong. It, the level should not matter if it's the culture. And that's something that's very important and I think it's hard, it's the truth, but it's real, it's, it's substantiated by data. It takes three to five years to see any kind of real cultural change in an organization. So that means there's gotta be a commitment and it's gotta be constant conversation every single management meeting, every single staff meeting, this, these are the values, this is how we're changing. Here's examples. Look at when Mary did X, Y, Z. Whoa, go Mary, that's really representing this cultural value. So it has to become an integral part where everybody understands it in plain English. Thank so you. the pictures on the wall, the activities that we do, the celebration of the metrics, all of that, Thank you so much for that. And we are over time and I want to be, no, it's okay. <laughs> I want to be conscious of our time. Mary, if you have one word for us. One quick thing is I just think always believe the best about your team. Even if you have to bless them to do their best work somewhere else, like it is what it is. But um, whenever you're giving them coaching feedback, always believe that they can do it. Um, and always speak to them as if you think they can do it, because that is going to be what's going to ultimately motivate them and show you whether or not they, they truly can. Um, and sometimes people that you didn't think could do it really rise to the occasion, and it's worth it in the end. Thank you so much for this panel today, and I'll send it right back to you, Jared. Thank you so much, Stephanie, Mary, Jan. Really enjoyed that discussion. Greatly appreciate it. And I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Helen Vernier with ACU, and uh, she'll lead us into a large group discussion. Helen? Thank you so much, Gerard. And thank you to our panelists, as well as our moderator, Mary Jan um, and Stephanie. Thank you so much for your sharing your wisdom with us. Um, so first, we're gonna start this large group discussion off with more Mentimeter um, stuff. So we'll get that, you can return to that same Mentimeter. Um, I'm also gonna see how bad I look without my blurred background on because I feel like my earrings are confused about whether they should be blurred or not. I just went back to the instructions so we can pause here for a quick second for folks who wanna scan the QR code or if you need to see the code you need to enter. Yeah. And I also put the link in the chat if you're um, accessing it through your computer. Thank you so much, Megan. Yeah. Um, while you all are getting on there, um, I do want to warn everyone where I am. There's a big storm of brewing. It's thundering and raining really hard, and there's a lot of wind. So if I drop off, my colleague and boss, Suzanne Spear, is going to take over. So if I suddenly disappear, it was the weather, um, but we can always use the moisture here in Colorado, so I'm not complaining. Awesome, and I see 39 people have joined us so far, so far, when are we good to wait another few seconds? Perfect. 
thinking about technical difficulties, let us know. Um, I'm not a pro at fixing Mentimeter, but I can try my best. <laughs> That's what we're all here to do, right? Try our best. Give give what we can and accept, accept that perfection is an illusion. Awesome. I see 50 people, so I'm going to go ahead and advance for you, Helen. Awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. Take a minute. Okay, so our first question, and this is like considering everything you've heard over the last two days that this whole um, large group discussion will be around that of like take, we're kind of trying to take everything we've heard, sort of integrate it, process it, um, and yeah, synergize what we have. So our first question is how would you describe the current coaching culture at your, that's supposed to say, or that's my bad, health center workforce? Um, and it could be with, at your BCA or HCCN or NTAP as well, but at your organization, what's going on? Got some stuff coming in, inconsistent is that, or non-existent, those are the top right now, but we'll see as things grow. Non-existent and inconsistent are still staying high, um, but we've also got possible and encouraging. There's some good stuff going on as well as some others, but I also really appreciate your honesty and vulnerability that, you know, some of it is haphazard, some of it's slow, some of it's in its infancy or it's a low priority, but there's, you know, that's what we're here to do is to think about how we can build that out got hierarchical available that's good in discussion I really love haphazard partly because I did not know that that's how you spelled haphazard and it's a good word because uh, it looks like it could be half hazard if you spelled out the ph as a which is always exciting uh I'm liking that evolving is sort of growing but we've still got non-existent and inconsistent as um our other two highest ones. So that's good for us to know. Um, with that, we can go to the next one. Again, we just sort of want to get some initial feedback and then we're going to open up and have like a real large conversation. So are there any barriers or it sounds like, yes, there are barriers and challenges that hindered the development of a strong coaching culture within your health center or organization. But so yeah, what are they? Yep, time, this idea of like, oh, we've always done things this way, funding problems or fund limited funding, a lack of trust, the desire, not people are, don't have the desire to participate, lack of CEO or leadership buy-in, leadership authority, the board and the exec team are in um, alignment, that can be a real struggle, the lack of leadership example, staff buy-in, Yep, the old narrative habit, we're seeing some of that as well. Um, that it's not made a priority. There's turnover. That is really real. It's really hard to engage or like build up a coaching culture, or a, a, you know, pathways program if you feel like folks are always leaving. The belief that it jeopardizes accountability. That's interesting. Lack of education or information on how it works. Yep, what it looks like or feels like. Yeah, fair enough. This is all, it's, I mean, a lot of it is in the same, you know, theme of like, we need leadership buy-in, we need time and money, and then we need the scaffolding and the infrastructure. Paternalism, we talked about paternalism in one of my breakout groups over the, earlier today. Um, post -pandemic hangover. I was just going to say I'll point out the one that I really love that someone just submitted post pandemic hangover yeah of like we've all just been surviving and now you want me to learn and grow and develop as a leader or be be a coach or be coached in some way yeah that's that's real for sure okay good to know good to know we'll go to the next question all right, so this is moving on to our second theme of, of staff well-being. So how would you rate your overall staff well-being within your organization, one being the lowest and 10 being like everyone is the happiest person on earth and nothing could be better? There's no eight, by the way. Oh, my God. The second seven is eight. We'll just go with that. <laughs> Thank you. 
all right so across the middle no one's like yet yeah, no one's like at the very very tippy top but again if they were i would be so excited for you and we'd all want to hear from you immediately um and then yeah we've got like truly looking like a good bell curve with some a little heavier weighted to the not doing so great okay let's see our next question all right so how would you describe the current level of collaboration and partnership between your health center and external stakeholders and again this is getting to our third theme around partnerships pathways those kinds of deals a lot of the things that we talked about yesterday so how are what's going on strong nice active moderate fair robust oh, love the word robust it just conveys so much needs to grow there's too much duplication of efforts for sure emerging some great some not fair enough good but not great educational community partnerships are strong fantastic some moderate some unstable vital and excellent oh again vital robust these are great words to describe things that are good uh, highly and mostly effectively collaborative, very nice, supportive, growing and strengthening. So honestly, of our three themes, this like partnership area so far seems, you know, to be like the strongest for this group, which is good to know and good for us to think about like the areas we need to be building on. And then I'm sure that there's some like cross like intersections of these things where what are ways that we can leverage any partnerships that we have to build a coaching culture or build out um that uh what any wellness programs and thinking around that oh uh, but there's still there's also of course some that aren't great some isolated some fleeting some other other person can do it um in the chat we've got stable but growing okay and then i think we have one more question if i'm not mistaken counting is hard sometimes uh all right so what are some potential opportunities for developing new partnerships or strengthening those existing ones so for those of you that entered that you have really strong partnerships how can you be strengthening those or build, you know building on those to build other ones and for those of you who are saying you yeah, know we don't quite have these partnerships or collaborations up and running yet what are those opportunities for developing new ones more frequent communication for sure higher visibility or community involvement definitely connections with regional agencies around workforce I think this gets at like how do we build coalitions and so maybe for those of you who do have strong uh strong connections like maybe put in the chat even what has worked or how have you built those so we've got pca collaborations with education group groups bringing on a new staff with partnership skills or established relationships for sure being the driver again getting back to that consistent communication a mindset that allows for new strategy the old way ain't working fair enough and then continuing to uphold each other through encouragement yes absolutely surfacing our fears and assumptions about competition and focusing on our roles within the larger ah oh, like snaps to that amazing the larger uh sorry i didn't finish the sentence larger local healthcare landscape so yeah coming to those conversations with that vulnerability around the fear but then like tackling it and figuring out where everyone's roles will be because yeah we can't do this alone and health health centers can't be everything to everyone and so we really do need to be working in partnership and collaboration to fit into that like it says larger local landscape um partnering with high schools to build training opportunities awesome getting to that pathways piece participation is the first step so yeah us us being participatory as well as as part of building those relationships and partnerships and then there's one i can't read continuing to find means of developing workforce for more skilled roles shared vision and goals and communication with them nice Okay, awesome. Well, that's my last question to sort of like for us all to see where each other are in the process and for us all to um, 
yeah, for us to know like where the conversation is going and where some of our peers are and where, you know, we can hope to, to go ourselves. So I'm going to challenge you all this group. You're awesome. Workforce folks are the best folks. I mean, clinical folks and we're all awesome, but we all know that workforce folks are great, including clinical folks who are workforce folks. Um, so you've been fantastic so far, and I'm going to challenge you to continue to be fantastic, even though here we are near the end of the summit, near the end of our days. But there's been so much engagement in the chat, and I know that my breakout groups were really engaged. So I'm going to challenge you to join me in this large group discussion, and I'm going to ask some questions and put it out to the group, and I want to hear from you, and I want you to hear from your peers, and we're just going to sort of like have a, imagine if we were in person, in a big room, and we're all talking about some things that really matter to all of us. So with that in mind, and with sort of some of the information you have already about where your peers are in this process, um, getting back to the coaching culture piece of it, um, what are folks thinking about how we can encourage and support the integration of, culture, of coaching practices into daily workflow and interactions? After you've, after a lot of the content of today, what's bubbling to the top there of how we can really encourage and support the integration of coaching practices into daily workforce and interactions? And I'm going to put that question in the chat too, in case it's easier for you to take information in by seeing it. Um, are reading it. I'll give everyone a moment to think, but yeah, I want to hear from you. And I believe in you that you'll participate and you won't just leave me sitting here in silence in a rainy town. Well, well, there's one thing that comes to my mind, and this is very much driven in kind of a deconstruction. It's more, I don't know, theoretical, but, you know, in, in, you know, taking this idea of queering things up and taking this idea of, you know, deconstructing what is, I mean, uh, we had presenters talk about that uh, today, uh, both taking a look at where you can learn and who you can learn from, and it doesn't have to be a top down. You know, sometimes, sometimes, oh, yes, now nah, I seriously, sometimes, mm, you know, being out there and doing the work um, and, and even coming in with the fresh interns, I, you know, uh, when you have interns, when you have somebody who has just recently graduated, whether it be on the medical side or, you know, behavioral health, uh, or even somebody coming in new for like marketing and, and social media stuff, you know, really listening to them. I mean, that's why we hire them, you know, but listening to them and not just like, yay, we checked the box, but instead like, yeah, dang, let's implement it. Like, let's be inclusive of the stuff. Yeah, for sure. I love that. And you're getting claps uh, in the chat, claps on the <laughs> as reactions. I think that that's so important. I think we've heard a decent amount. I think this kind of speaks to this idea of like generations. And at the ACU Star Center, we try to really challenge this idea that like generations are inherently different um, because you know, we do a whole webinar about where generations came from, and I won't go into that. But basically, I think I really value your point of like, no matter what generation someone is in, if they're coming into your, your organization, they're bringing that new perspective. Um, and we can, yeah, we need to be tapping into that. And yeah, uh, like dismantling these hierarchical systems, you know, we saw that in the Mentimeter a lot that that's part of the problem is, you know, no leadership buy-in or a hierarchical system or this idea of like, that's always how we did it. And we, and we can see that that's a problem. People are reporting that that's a problem. So yeah, thank you so much. We've also got in the chat um, using a curiosity mentality, which definitely relates back to what you were saying, Tanisha. Um, not a judgment mentality, also working to allow the team member to come up with their own answers. Managers don't have to come up with all the answers for sure. And then transparency and ownership. I think, yeah, I think in this room, we've got like some really good energy for this, these ideas of like, yeah, breaking down those hierarchical systems. And now we just need to, we need to get in there and be little mice who chew with the wires of the hierarchies. Nice. Anything else that's coming up for folks about how we can encourage and support the integration of that co of those coaching practices into daily workflow and interactions? And so, I know, I'm sorry. Go, go 
Go ahead. No, I just, I, you know, as someone who's mentored by Mary Blankson and I, you know, learned from her also, I think what's really important is just starting to be a mentor because that trickle down has long standing impact on your organizations. And I know my hopes and ambitions to be a good mentor mirror the good mentors that I had. And I try really hard to continue to reflect on that um, and learn from Mary Mary Blanks and Margaret Flinter and continue to feed off of that and then try to mirror that behavior and learn and grow. And it's something that I've practiced, been intentional about, made it a goal with Margaret, with Mary and had that open. And someone said transparency and ownership. I really love that. Just making it important. I know a, a good example is I had to go to Oregon and I asked Megan to come with me. And I learned a lot from her through that process. And I hope that she learned from me and we can kind of grow together as a team. And I think just trying is really all you can do. And I hope that, that you take that with you. And I, and I look up to Mary and Margaret so much for that mentorship. So just my final thoughts on that. Thanks, Helen. Absolutely. And I really love what you said about you. That's what you practice. Like it's not something you didn't just start coaching and mentoring. And one day everything was perfect. You practiced it. It's a skill you, you are continually growing in yourself and yeah, passing on to, uh, the next, the, the you know, a, 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 per, a new person, not the next generation. I, again, we don't, I don't like that. Michelle, it looks like you want to say something. And I think Tanisha, you had something to say, so I didn't want to like jump in first if you were going to say something. You know, well, so really quickly, I just wanted to share that, you know, th th this is maybe the uh, the benefit of coming from a clinical, the, you know, psychosocial model, but mirror neurons are a thing. It's a human condition thing. And, you know, it did the old school, you know, therapy was mimesis, right? Yeah, well, okay, we don't really do this. So the pardon, you know, the example here, you know, if your client is smoking a cigarette, right, this, this is what they would do. That, that's really tacky. So, so, so an old one, but, you know, we really want to connect. We want to be seen. And so if we are modeling that in, in transparency for me, I'm traumatized by that word. It, it's, it's used it, when, when I hear somebody say it, my, the hairs on the back of my neck go, oh, okay right? It's what we do. We speak with our feet, but uh, that idea of mirror neurons, absolutely. We need to see it shown to us. And so when we have somebody who is mentoring that and we want to put that in like, oh man, yeah, I see that. And I really like that. That, that is, I mean, that is just tried and true and you don't need a degree to know that. And that's beautiful stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I agree 100%. <laughs> like with everything um, you just said, Tanisha. And what I was going to say was the importance of the constant bi directional communication of ensuring that if you're going to be a mentor, somebody who's, you know, in the coaching role, that you're also putting aside, I think, that natural ego aspect and the the already power differentials that exist that you are not just sort of imparting that on someone else but they're also imparting just as much on you and you're learning just as much from them as they're learning from you so I think the coaching mentoring I really see it more than anything as a partnership um, and I think having a trauma-informed perspective on this yeah <laughs> I also come I come from a social work background so I I've seen you on camera and I'm like totally get it um <laughs> because yeah we don't we don't know people's backgrounds we don't know what you know language may affect people we there's so much we don't know and you have to build a space of trust and that only comes from being trauma-informed but also ensuring that people know that they're not your ego is not going to sort of overtake everything and they're just there supposedly to learn from you and they can't provide anything back so that was it <laughs> fantastic so agree michelle thank you so much for sharing and in the chat we've got some information someone says uh, or emily says as a foundation to building a coaching culture working to actively identify and disrupt shame in medicine culture that may exist within the organization 
or that staff may have brought in with them that's yeah so important and um there's some there's some links in there to click um and then we've also got partnering is so important leveling the playing field and removing barriers um i think that that then goes back to our you know jedi lens of approaching things of like yeah who's getting these opportunities and how are we making you know how are we making these decisions if we are you know we heard from some folks who are paying for their staff to to go uh, uh, and get these trainings and have these things which absolutely we should be paying people as they level up i love that and thinking about how we're choosing folks and if there are any you know what what biases are coming in is the are the you know people who are really good at negotiating then getting those those opportunities whereas someone who comes from a more quiet or reserved culture that's just their personality um are they are they having those same opportunities offered to them so i really appreciate that thinking about leveling those playing field and and removing the barriers Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for your thoughtfulness on that question. Um, so now I want to move into thinking about staff well-being. And we saw, again, that kind of bell curve with a little bit of a lean towards the not so great end. Um, so what specific initiatives or strategies have been implemented at your health center or your organization to enhance staff well-being and create a uh, healthier, more well work environment, or um, and what 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 could be implemented? What may so things that have already been implemented, and things that you could see in the future, and then for the things that have been implemented, like what what has worked or not worked? And I'll put that in the chat as well. So the organization has taken on, and, and this is a large F FQHC, so 17 locations, more than 700 uh, employees, and we have a committee that is driven, it's, a, it's an acronym, uh, necrostic, for, um, uh, it, it is cheer, and I, I don't know if um, uh, Cheryl Lord Hernandez uh, is available to look this up for me. I yeah. forget what the acronym is, but it's uh, it's 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 highly encouraging. Um, this is something that gets sent out uh, on a monthly basis, and it, it it hits these ideas of like, hey, what's going on for the month? Uh, you know, are they nationally recognized um, holidays, or um, you know, even holidays that are more significant across cultures, across ethnicities, uh, across uh, you know, different societies, right? Different norms. Um, that is a beautiful thing, and there is some room for growth in that in terms of what is being recognized. And if we're recognizing some, how can we recognize all? And if that becomes too much, then, you know, um, maybe there's just some room for better understanding how to do that. Uh, another thing is, hey, giving some kudos, you know, hey, you know, give some shout outs to your peers, uh, give some shout outs to people who, you know, you caught them doing something good. And um, some of that has been a little bit competitive, you know, hey, who's going to get the most, who can send the most, as opposed to value-based. Mm -hmm. But those are neat ideas, and, and I, I think probably, yeah, lots more to, uh, to do with that. Yeah, thank you, Tanisha. It's um, uh, CHEER is the Committee for Health and Happiness, Employee Engagement and Recognition, oh. and we are just about to come up on our year of being in existence and so yeah there's to everything tanisha said is true there's definitely a lot of opportunity in there to to grow it adapt it a little bit um and we also want to uh, put in there the deib feature probably in the coming year um to be able to make sure that we are being very inclusive um there were some things that we didn't do because we didn't know how to do um and we didn't want to do recognize one group without also recognizing another group um, with regards to diversity and things. And so it can be a little tricky, but we got to start somewhere, right? You got to start somewhere. Um, and, and bringing that connection across clinics um, 
and across departments. It's been really fun. It's been really fun. And I think it's, it's a good thing overall for sure. Thanks for bringing that up. Nice. Thank you both for sharing. And I really love your point of like, we've got to start somewhere. I think so often, especially around JEDI or DEI or DEIB or IDEA, you know, there's so many acronyms. Um, across that work, there's, we sometimes let perfect be the enemy of the good. And it's, it, we can never be perfect. In fact, perfect is a social construct in and of itself and perfectionism you know is a marker of white supremacy culture and so if we let go of that idea that we have to do it exactly right from the very start or ever even then we can yeah like you're saying get started and grow from there I think that's really powerful and I'm so glad you all are doing that um, I wanted to share that in the chat, someone said that we've recently been constructing a 2000 piece puzzle. Everyone has sees the puzzle differently as a matter of perspective and the puzzle will be framed once we as a team finish it together. I love that as like a team project, something you can just like put one or two pieces in as you're walking by. That's very out of the box, pun intended, and very very fun. All right. And then, yeah, like we heard, cheers, the community for health, happiness, employee engagement and recognition. I really like that. Um, oh, and then we've got Michelle saying, and failure is really important too. It's always seen as a negative, but how do we test, evolve, try and learn without it for sure. And it should be more accepted. Yes. I love that point. I wanted to share, and this is something I learned from a health center that I conducted an interview with, the interview is available at the link that I just put in the chat. One of their um, well-being activities is that they have a rotation of RNs whose entire job is to cover leave so that everyone can take leave without feeling like they're overburdening their colleagues and that it doesn't create that like, oh, so-and-so went on vacation and now I have this extra work. And so yeah, the RNs like go to different sites and if no one's on vacation, which is relatively rare, there's still work for them to be doing. But I think that was a really cool idea of like employing people whose entire job is to provide coverage for providers who are going on vacation. I think that's really cool. And then Denisha put in the chat, when we learn, we suffer, we suffer, wait, we, when we learn to suffer, <laughs> we suffer much, much less. Oh, I love that. And growth-minded framing of what is ahead of us and what is uncomfortable. Amanda, did you want to add something? Sure. I actually wanted to let everyone know that we're going to start to kind of slow down the day. We thank you, Helen, for leading this. I, I think what's really special is that as NTAPS, the conversation doesn't have to stop, that this is just one of the many activities, opportunities that we have, areas for conversation and space to work together to continue to take on the challenges that we take on every day in hopes of providing the best possible quality care for our patients and supporting our workforce so that we can continue to do that. And I just want to thank you all that I think it's really, really special that we're here today. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we still have time. Am I wrong? Gerard, you're confusing me. Do we still have time? I think we still have 15 minutes. Gerard gave me, Gerard, you confused me. He said, do you want to go ahead and get started? I'm just kidding. Let me just finish my thank you. Good thoughts still. Yeah. Also great thoughts. I do have to jump though, but okay. I want everyone to know that I encourage you all to continue to join our sessions and continue to have these conversations and join us throughout the coming activities in the coming year. And I thank you for joining us. And Gerard, you got me all confused. <laughs> Keep on going. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you for sharing your insights throughout, and I absolutely second that um, emotion, uh, as we say, <laughs> to, yeah, we're, I mean, I'm, and we will continue this conversation for the next 15 minutes, too, but we as NTABs and as primary care associations, regional primary care associations, HCCNs, we're here, and we're excited to be having these conversations in, you know, big events like this, but also in smaller, in smaller groups, um, and so, yeah, I encourage, I second Amanda's uh, sentiment that we should be 
that we can continue having these conversations as the as the months and years progress. So also getting back into it, because I want to keep talking to you all for 15 minutes with you all. Um, on the in the chat, we've got use Pat on the back awards for outstanding recognition of hard work, cultural diversity lunch meeting, where the staff can bring meals specific to the cultural, uh, their culture to explain the diverse background. Diversity holiday allowed one eight hour day off to celebrate your culture. Um, some people refer to that as like a floating holiday. So that's awesome to provide that. Uh, this is on top of the regular paid leave wellness walking and dancing group with access to classrooms for using to host amazing food trucks to include smoothie and healthy meals to assist with the 30 minute quick lunch. Oh my God, Paula, y'all are on it. You have so much going on. Um, if you wouldn't mind coming off mute, can you tell us a little bit about like how some of those programs got started? Oh, I think it's just because we do have such a diverse group. Let me turn my camera on. I'm sorry. Um, we do have such a diverse group in our area because we are in the um, right now, currently Fort Bragg area, which will be Fort, uh, Fort Liberty here soon. Um, and then we have people from all over who do have so many different backgrounds and, and just trying to open up ourselves to um, some of the conversations we had earlier, learning the people that we work with. And how do we learn? We go through exposure. And so I'm um, exposing people to, we have three different levels here in this facility um, from our clinical areas to our administrative areas to our uh, CPD continuing education classes. And sometimes those people don't even intertwine. They don't even see each other unless they're passing each other on a staircase. So we had um, done some surveys internally and like what kind of ideas do we come up with? How do we people to know each other when they walk in a room or greet each other in the hallway. And so a lot of those came out of those conversations and those surveys. Um, the food trucks kind of came in when COVID did. Uh, we had to change over from uh, uh, our lunches for our staff to 30 minute lunches. And so having easier access to some healthier meals, you know, smoothies, uh, coffee trucks and things like that, they actually brought them on campus. And that became also something good for the staff because they could go out and stand while they were waiting in line and, you know, and and mingle with each other and they got to know each other a lot better. So the dance classes and things like that were all part of um, a healthy living kind of doing some wellness things. We have people who wanted to dance who didn't want to necessarily pay for a gym membership. So with us having classroom environments in our system, we just kind of like, can we use these rooms in the evenings for these practices? And so it's just been, um, it's a really great opportunity to diversity. Having a, those extra floating holidays really does pay off for our staff because they get very excited about having uh, about 17 extra hours off a year that is not charged against a regular paid leave. So those have all been um, great. And we do a little Easter basket thing for uh, around the holiday there. Um, our HR manager goes around and she has eggs in an Easter basket and you get to choose and it could be a gift card to Starbucks. It could be an eight hour day. It could be four hours of PTO. It could be um, you know, candy from your favorite store. So they try, they do try to um, improve the relationships with um, the staff here to make it a better working environment for our wellness. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, that sounds, um, I, I like that it, some of it came out of like necessity for flexibility. And then that like grew into this really positive, powerful thing. That's awesome. Thanks. Um, and Michelle in the chat says, my first job out of college, the org offered rides for staff who were left later in the evening, both to help get down on commute time, but also for safety. Uh, I was in NYC, so no one had a car. One of the ERs I worked in in BC did the same for staff who had to take public transportation that wasn't running late at night. That's awesome. I could see, especially, um, I also worked at, I used to work at a university and like universities have like safe ride home programs or they, they uh, many of them do. And when I would work late, I often utilize that program and I don't see why some of our, you know, larger organizations couldn't um, work to, you know, be included in a, in a university program that already exists like that or create their own. I think that's a great idea. I love that. All right. Well, in our last 10 minutes of our large group discussion, I want to talk about partnerships and pathways. And again, this is an area that a lot of you express being really strong in. Um, so what are, let me look at my questions and decide what I want to ask you, actually. Um, 
All right, so what strategies and pathways have you implemented to enhance career development and growth opportunities for your health center workforce or your organizational um, workforce? Uh, I'd love to hear, because again, we had some really, we've heard from some experts that presented, but then we also had some really great responses in that Mentimeter about this is an area that you're already really strong in. So I'd love to hear from folks. And I'll put it in the chat as well. Um, and Katya's putting in the chat that NAC recently explored the power of cre creativity for healing to shine the light on the ways uh, art and creativity can enhance healing in the health center setting and recharge care teams through a four-part webinar series. Uh, here's the link to the NAC blog um, and the link for the recorded event. So that's awesome. Yeah, and that, I, that sort of reminds me of the puzzle of like, it doesn't have to be like, oh, we're all going to go meditate together or whatever. But yeah, this idea of like, well, how can we have a creative outlet within this potentially stressful environment? I love the animated uh, Zoom things that like the thumbs up isn't just a stagnant thumbs up. Now it goes. Anyway, that's a side note. But what are some strategies or pathways um, or strategies around pathways that your organizations have implemented or created to enhance career development and growth opportunities? We can also meditate together, Gerard. We can dance, we can crochet, we can meditate, all the things. Um, Cheryl shared that they have developed a 25 plus career path maps. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. And they'll digitize these to be more user friendly by the end of the year. Cheryl, will you share those with us when they're ready? Because we would absolutely love to see them. Sure, we can uh, we can email you some uh, samples of what they are right now, like in PDF mm -hmm. format. Um, they're really great discussions tools for managers when they have someone coming to them saying, I'm kind of bored in my job. And now what's my next thing for me? The managers pull those out and it's helpful. Oh my God, that's great. Yeah, I think so often, and I've definitely experienced this in my career, you don't know, we don't know what we don't know. And so we don't know what a career pathway can look like if we're, you know, in a certain position, we don't know what the next steps are. And there's not necessarily one exact pathway, but just having that example um, is really helpful. So I'm so excited that y'all are doing that. And then Michaela shared that she thinks that letting people know career ladders and such uh, to grow within because a lot of folks don't know the past to get to the different places in the organization. Again, same, same feeling of like, yeah, we don't know what we don't know. So sometimes it's someone might want to grow in an organization, but we don't necessarily even know what question to ask. And we, you know, so having those those pathways laid out and available is really great. All right, so what are what are some other partnerships? Leave aside the pathways piece. How are other folks engaging in partnerships at your organization? I, I feel like that was at the Mentimeter, in the Mentimeter, there was a lot of really strong responses there. So I wanna, I wanna hear the details of those. Paige shared that Idaho has created the Idaho Launch Program. It was created as a response to the pandemic to fill workforce gaps, makes sense. And now it's used to help adults get skills for in-demand careers and create those pathways. It's a really good model and it's run by the Idaho Workforce Development Council and they're partnering with them to present this program to the health center staff, awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that can also, again, to Michaela's point of thinking about like, how can we upskill, but also cross skill folks so that they can, you know, there's all these different options and it doesn't have to be this just like ladder. It can be this like lattice of opportunities and we can be experimenting and experiencing like different parts of our health centers operations or our organization. I know we've got folks from PCAs and HCCNs and AHECs as well. So, but I, I think it's applicable for all of our organizations of, and again, that sort of gets at what we were talking about of like getting away from hierarchies and instead 
focusing on like what are valuable experiences that can help you grow as a person and in your career. Um, so that's awesome that there's that that stuff's going on in Idaho. All right, in our last six minutes, is there anything anyone else wants to share on partnerships and pathways or anything else that's just like bubbling to the top for you after these two days? We've heard a lot from a lot of experts, but also you're all experts. And so what's coming up as we move into the closing of the day and start to think about how we're gonna implement things that we've learned here in these last two days? Hi, Helen. While we wait for folks to come up and to answer that, I'm going to go ahead and launch our evaluation poll, if that's okay. Yes, please do. Thank you. And then, Tanisha, were you going to add something? Curiosity and interest, just as, you know, um, that that step forward going into meetings, you know, hey, what is the purpose here if, if you're not seeing that, uh, you know, doing that, you know, certainly call in. Um, you know, it will put somebody on the defense. They're not going to, you know, necessarily be working with us. So, you know, just being curious, you know, hey, what else could there be? Mm. You know, hey, you know, where else could this go? Or, you know, how else might that look? I love that. Yeah, that's awesome. And then back to our last question, just I don't want to miss any of our content. Paula shared that they offer a HEC Scholar programs, which is a two year program to recruit to healthcare, and they offer virtual practice manager academy to recruit and train office managers for clinics. That's awesome, Paula. A HECs are the best. I mean, again, we're all the best, but I love an A HEC. And for those in case you don't know, an A HEC is an area health education center. So if you're in the workforce world, find your AHEC and work with them because they're great. Yeah, I'm finding myself really inspired by all of you, all the work that you're doing already, hearing from a, a lot of these experts, um, I think is really wonderful. Of course, we try to bring you exciting, you know, speakers and content, but then seeing the amount of engagement in the chat really showed me that like y'all are in it. You're doing the work, you're creating better environments for yourselves and your health center staff and therefore your patients. Like it all comes down to, of course, we want to be serving our patients, but we can't do that if we're not serving our, um, our, our own employees. And in one of my breakout groups, and I already shared this with a different <laughs> breakout groups, but in one of my breakout groups, someone shared, and I'm sorry, I can't remember who you were. So shout out if it was you, that they have, they're applying this um, customer service lens to how they're treating their employees as well. And I think that that's a really nice way to think about it of like, yes, and we as employees are in service to our patients and our communities, but our organizations should be acting in service to us. And I really, I really like that. Um, Michelle says she feels motivated by the last two days. I absolutely agree. What else is coming up for people? Is there anything that anyone's like, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna only check my email for 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the afternoon. Tomorrow I'm gonna chunk my time or I'm going to make sure I go get eight hours of sleep. What are, what are our commitments leaving this two day experience? I'll just offer up and be vulnerable and honest and say that I'm going to ask my team if certain meetings that we have are necessary. So, you know, because I want to know that was something that I was like, Hmm, we should have a discussion about this. I just thought that was working, but Maybe we should actually talk about it. Awesome. I love that. Nice. Michaela feels motivated to create a vision board to remind herself to take care of herself and to value her time better. Yes. I know within the, we, you know, of course we have a little Slack group and within our ACU group, someone shared from their breakout group uh, that the quote of like, I'm going to take care of me because I am worth taking care of. So I also really love that piece of like, yeah, we're all worth taking care of and we're all, we're all worth giving ourselves love. So that's wonderful. 
Well, thank you all so much for engaging with me in this. I know doing a large group discussion um, of a hundred plus people at the beginning kind of dropped down, but that's okay. Can be really nerve wracking and can be intense, but I really appreciate you all coming together to share with me and have this conversation. Um, we do still have some closing remarks from Gerard. So I'll pass it back to Gerard and thank you all so much again for being here with us and participating in this. Um, and Suzanne, uh, we'll get you information about completing CE registration for nursing. Thank you all so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much, Helen. And thank you all for your participation in this large group discussion and in the Workforce Summit overall. Uh, it's hard to believe that uh, we moved through these two days. Uh, it seems very quickly, thanks to all the the contributions, your engagement and participation over the last uh, last day or so. So um, I, I want to, to highlight just a couple of the, the tips that stood out to me over the course of today. Uh, we heard from April, um, April Lewis earlier today, uh, engaging discussion on how to be well, managing our time and our energy. Uh, a couple of points that stood out that I'm going to try to implement myself is, you know, start a meeting with, after this meeting, we will achieve X, right? Uh, going into the meeting with the objective in mind uh, and making sure that, you know, that meeting is designed to achieve that objective. And then she said, at the end of the day, ask the question, was my day productive? Was my day productive? Um, a very good question that uh, we might ask ourselves and you know, defining what productive uh, certainly means for us. What did we produce? Uh, and then we heard from Gary Campbell uh, who highlighted the culture transformation work that's being done at Johnson Health Center. That's an ongoing effort. Uh, he covered a couple of points that, uh, that stood out to me. Uh, know your why and work to understand the why of your people, right? Of your employees, of the staff, that, that getting to know the why uh, plays such a key role uh, in being able to help an to have an, an, an organizational culture of engagement um, uh, and, 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 and development. Uh, and then show a personal interest in others, be, out beyond just the job that they do, uh, uh, April mentioned that you know it's 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 people first, employees second. Um, you know, getting to show a personal interest in people beyond just the job that they do within the organization, and write down the important stuff. Uh, if any of you like me, uh, your memory is 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 limited. Uh, so writing down that important stuff, and then being intentional, being intentional. Uh, about uh, that that personal interest that you display in others. Uh, and this afternoon we had a, a great panel discussion. Got to uh, certainly hear from uh, from Mary and Jan. Uh, a couple of tips from that that stood out to me from that discussion is that coaching is important at all levels of the organization, uh, but preparation is needed uh, as well. Uh, again, this concept of we have to be intentional uh, to create a culture of coaching. Uh, and they left off, left us with start with the executive team and the board. Um, that leadership uh, engagement is critical to uh, cultivating a coaching culture. And then always believe the best about your team. Always believe the best uh, about your people, even if it's that uh, the best that they'll do is someplace else. But always believe in the best, uh, in the best of your people. So such great insights uh, that uh, we've been able to gather here over the last uh, last day or so. Um, so what's next? Uh, what is next for us? If we can bring up the, the, the final slide, uh, please, Michelle. Thank you very much. Uh, we want to certainly, you've already addressed the evaluation poll in Zoom. Uh, we want to encourage you to complete the session evaluations for your uh, in the registration portal uh, to get your CMEs or your CE credits. Uh, that's uh, through the same portal through which you registered for uh, for this event. Uh, and then we're going to be we're going to be developing a uh, setting up a workforce online community for you. Um, 
to follow up on what you've been able to, to begin, some of the conversations that you've been able to start. We've uh, been able to see so much networking among you that's happening in the breakout discussions, as well as uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, you've Some of you have shared your emails uh, in order to, to, to uh, request additional contact and information. So we're, we're gonna set up a community uh, to allow you to be able to stay in touch with one another and to stay connected uh, with us. Um, uh, so, so look for an invitation uh, to come to you uh, if you register for this event to join that uh, online community. Uh, it's certainly been a, a joy to be able to, um, on behalf of NAC, it's certainly been a joy to be able to collaborate as always with our partners at uh, ACU and Moses Weissman Health Center to be able to uh, bring this Workforce Summit to fruition. Uh, I wanna thank our partners uh, at ACU and Moses Weissman Health System. I also want to express our appreciation to uh, HRSA, uh, who is, uh, as a result of their generous support, uh, we've been able to make this event possible now for the fourth uh, time around. Uh, since 2017, we've been able to do this uh, every other year. Uh, again, wanna ask you if, you, if there was one thing that you liked through this summit, please let uh, members of the advisory group know. Um, they did such a wonderful job guiding us, helping us to make sure that this event was relevant, uh, that uh, we covered topics that were of importance to you uh, in the field. So uh, thanks so much to the advisory, uh, to the national advisory group uh, and, and to our planning team as well, uh, who worked uh, behind the scenes to, to pull together all the pieces of the puzzle uh, to make this work well. Uh, thanks uh, to all of them. Uh, our, gosh, we had great speakers, moderators, panelists, presenters, uh, our folks uh, working for both the, the, um, the breakout sessions as well as moderating the, the, the uh, panels. Thank you to all of you. And most importantly, thank you to those of you who took the time out. I mean, we've had 10 hours of your time over the last two days that you've made yourselves available to invest in uh, yourselves, uh, to connect with your colleagues uh, and to be able to, to both learn about and to share uh, the promising practices that you're implementing in the field. It's such a joy to be able to hear about them, to learn about them uh, and to be able to highlight them uh, through this Workforce Summit. Uh, so we uh, will, uh, please, uh, these resources are, are being captured that uh, has been shared throughout uh, and are available through the registration portal uh, as along with the slides and um, uh, the recording uh, will be there soon as well. So please uh, feel free to go back, take a look at that information and uh, use it uh, to the extent, feel free to share it with others. Uh, as well, who might not have been able to, to join us for the summit uh, over the past couple of days. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to uh, allow you to return to uh, the, 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 the joy at work uh, that uh, you all are, are experiencing and have expressed for us and to us. Uh, thank you again uh, to my colleagues at ACU and CHC Inc. Thank you all for joining us, everyone. Um, we'll be in touch and please stay in touch. Take care, everybody.